right, all right. Welcome back, guys, to part two of our Irizing interview. I hope you guys are ready as always. It's your boy, Heavy Days, here at the podcast, the cannabis podcast for budding enthusiasts. As always, a big shout out to Seeds Here Now, amazing sponsors, guarantee on germination and satisfaction. What more could you ask for? Well, you might need to keep that garden running when you're popping those seeds. So hit up our amazing new sponsors, Pop It Biological Systems, all of the beneficial predators you need, all of the beneficial microbial products you need, and even some artificial feeds to help boost the numbers of your beneficial army while the cycle's running. As always, a huge thank you to the Patreon gang, lifeblood of the show, early access to episodes, additional content, interviews with Bodie, interviews with me and Gene, interviews with Bob Hemphill, the list goes on. Check it out, patreon.com forward slash the podcast. Hope you guys are ready for part two. We're going to be jumping straight into it with your boy Irizing. Lock in for another two hours. Let's get into it. So yeah, what a fantastic explanation of all the different areas. If we kind of just keep on that same topic, I noticed in one of your posts, you're in one of the valleys looking at one of the different farms in the Khyber Pass around the Pakistani area. And you mentioned how some of the farmers liked to import the high altitude varieties and they'd hybridize it with their stock and it would give a kind of quicker flowering, more squat, more resinous plant. This was like... You mentioned this as though it was done very intentionally and methodically. Do you feel like this type of breeding has always occurred? Because I think people often talk about land race breeding as though there wasn't a ton of um, kind of, shall we say, intelligent breeding done, but this very much points to the opposite. Exactly. <clears throat> That's a very good point, by the way. I mean, um, the way you I mean, tend to even, like put it across. So, I mean, there are a few different things happening, of course, here, like everywhere else. So first of all, we have to understand, you know, the cultural basis of that practice. Now, this is not something that has been happening for the longest period of time. Like this has not definitely not been happening for thousands of years in Pakistan. Okay. Now, some of the regions of Pakistan, I, I mean, even before we get to that, I mean, <clears throat> let me just uh, build a little more, you know, cultural context here because... See, Pakistan is predominantly, it's a, it's a Muslim country that people over there, at least 95% of the people are Muslim by religion. And the country that is next to them is Afghanistan. And that is also uh, predominantly, you know, Muslim family. Uh, I'm sorry, a Muslim country. I'm so sorry about that. It's a Muslim country, right? So now uh, you, you tend to have a great deal of interaction between these two countries because of this common theme, which is the Islamic religion. Right. So now what is happening is there are certain areas of Pakistan where this happens. And those areas are uh, situated around Tira Valley. That is like 32, 31 and 33 degree north. OK, now those uh, regions, while they are significantly higher, are still not you know high enough on latitude that they would induce a quintessential uh, expression that people, uh, you know, usually refer to as Afghanica. Okay. So what happened was that some of the people from Pakistan must have been traveling to, you know, Afghanistan, and they must be seeing these varieties over there that tend to have, you know, better resin content, better effects, and just, they're just better overall. I mean, in, in terms of production, I mean, that's one of the reasons why, you know, everybody wants to breed with them. So it was a very natural progression for them to only get those seeds in Pakistan. But here is the interesting part. Now, they're not intelligently thinking at this point in history that, OK, we're going to get these seeds to our country and then we're going to mix them with our, uh, you know, indigenous varieties or, you know, the regional varieties that we have. They're not thinking in those terms. That is something that is going to happen as a result of they getting those seeds into their country because they think that you know of course these the, these are so much better i mean the high is if not better i mean it's so much different so i mean such is uh, you know our human species i mean you know that our nature is just we're curious and we want to have everything and we want to have things which are different we want to know why they're different so they must have, you know, gotten those varieties and started cultivating them, not, not knowing that uh, eventually they will get cross-pollinated to your regional varieties. So in the end, uh, you know, what you, re what you really end up with uh, in, in, a, in a way that people are not selecting 
after you know after they're getting cross pollinated because they're not really thinking about that they're just then picking up seeds and they're growing them and eventually what you see is you see an intermediate type of plant emerge from this interaction because of course there are going to be still very short plants like afghani varieties which would still stay intact and you would always see them pop up in larger populations you would also see on the other hand you know uh the thin leaf variety the regional varieties from pakistan uh, within the larger populations of that mixed crop they they will pop up but what you would see in majority is majority you would see a uh, a plant you know which is a perfect amalgamation of both of those worlds and which also seem to have certain you know qualities which not only make it better uh in terms of effects or in terms of production that is yield it also you know uh makes it better in survival and you know in mitigating the environmental risk so for example i'll i'll, I'll just go this small example and that would really uh, you know make things more comprehensive in afghanistan uh if if you go to uh bulk if you go to bulk province it's really dry arid there is hardly any rain uh, you know year round and most people rely on the glacial waters so the varieties which are growing there i mean they're not accustomed to you know uh, rain falling on them especially not in, during the flowering time even if a little bit does fall in the spring so when you take those varieties to a place like tira valley where you have an annual annual rainfall of close to 900 mm uh, right so then you're uh, what you're really doing is that you're really pushing that variety uh you know in a, in, a, in a way that the phenotypes or let's say the genotypes you know which are uh what you should say which are resistant to mold mildew or you know mitigating these uh you know moisture related risk would then you know excel and eventually what's going to happen is that the plants which are not able to uh, mitigate those moisture related risk would die out because they will not be able to you know they will have bud rot and because of that their seeds uh will be less viable or viable in less numbers of what i mean to say and eventually every year their population would decrease because of that and you know we we understand i mean how population works and you know in natural settings and eventually what you're going to see is that only a marginal amount of you know the original variety that was brought from afghanistan survives intact of course with a little bit of change and then a little bit of you know pakistani would remain but what would really overtake and what would really become of uh, you know the whole process or what would really emerge as the one champion in that you know a whole uh, breeding thing is the intermediate plant that is not only better than both parents it also has the capabilities to mitigate all the risk and still bring all the properties from the afghani varieties which which is why they actually you know in the first place got those seeds to pakistan so most of the uh, farmers tend to work with those and the interesting part is now there are some farmers which have gone a step beyond who have understood that you know what i could actually separate these two varieties and i could not only grow them separately i could have them interact or cross pollinate at my will so that i choose you know which plants get to make the seeds and then i would have like a test field kind of a thing which we which in modern world we call you know testing for uh the seeds that we make and they would grow them and then they would select plants you know which seem to show the best uh you know the, the best features what they're looking for regionally whatever makes their hash sell more so it could be yield it could be resin content so each one to their own but yes there are people who are now meticulously looking into these little aspects and you know uh it just became becoming apparent to these people that you know if they go on selecting for better plants they they eventually end up at you know better places yield wise production wise and quality wise yeah of course do you think that the modern breeders so to speak could learn anything from the older school farmers have you ever stumbled upon a little patch and kind of been impressed by a little trick or something you've seen by the farmer and i guess as a follow up as these more traditional farmers learn the more modern breeding techniques do you think there's a risk of us maybe losing a little something about their maybe slightly more primitive methods but maybe there's something to it which might be lost um uh, i mean if if 
I mean, if some somebody's to I mean answer this question in a very emotional, political way, then I mean, of course, he's going to say yes. There are a lot of things. I mean, you go back to roots and blah blah blah. But <clears throat> if we just break it down in a very practical manner and look at it objectively, then what do you understand is that uh, uh, there's not much that can be uh, adopted by the modern people because see the the it's not modern people it's not like modern people is a different species it's just that we what we are is that we have at our disposal the collective consciousness the collective intelligence of the entire community and that includes even those people who have no idea that you know uh, what they have been doing has been incorporated into the larger understanding of how to grow plants but what we have understood that you know there are better ways to do that you know at the same time i mean uh, w- 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 uh, there are communities in india you know uh, which have been using you know uh, lactobacillus bacteria and many other forms for you know uh, growing the plants and even for they spray like 50 50 solution of water and milk to uh, for the pests so it's not like these things have been uh invented or like uh you know brought by the modern cultivators these were all like simple indigenous uh techniques but at the same time they had refined them to a level and not only refined them i think uh, the what modern society or rather the modern com- uh, community of the breeders have done or the cultivators have done that they have uh you know they have scratched the surface beyond indigenous communities are capable of and that is on the scientific grounds because a lot of cultivator and breeders nowadays are like scientists basically so they can they not only breed with those varieties grow those varieties they they, they tend to i mean you know uh, scratch the surface that uh, you know what makes a certain technique work or what makes a certain technique not work like there's a lot of debate that goes around no till and tilling the soil i mean i i'm i know there are a lot of people who get really uh, you know edgy about this kind of discussions and it is just a v- amazing thing that you don't see in indigenous communities you don't see this kind of discussions usually they know something you know that has been told to them uh, by their families by their elders and they just um uh, blind uh, you blindly kind of follow that i'm not trying to say those are wrong things but what i'm trying to say here is that because we're not having a continued informed discussion the thing is only getting passed down it's not evolving any further it's not evolving into something better every year but that is what has happened in the modern society when we take up those concepts we don't just sit on them you know we, we we kind of expand them and we you know scratch the surface and you know try to understand why this works in this way and why not in that way and because we have the tools and the resources and you know the scientific understanding of uh, you know the cannabis has increased so much in the last few years thanks to you know all of these countries investing in uh, you know the information of uh, and dissemination of information of cannabis i'm really grateful but at, at the same time i mean uh, there's a big problem because you know even in uh, if you look at times like 70s 80s 90s in the modern uh, society i mean there wasn't much of that happening okay that only started happening like in, after 2000s i would say and because during 70s and 80s the people who were growing cannabis were not scientists and the people who were scientists they would not have grown cannabis at that point in time so that really kept cannabis away from you know scientific exposure for a very long time but uh, as we know later on people like you know rob clark and a lot of other people you know got into it and they started really you know fixing a few things explaining a few things and i i think they have what they have done is that they've really paved the path for other people you know uh to like not think about the stigma uh, related to this plant but just go ahead and use your scientific expertise and you know help the community you know bring out more and more information and in 2020 the situation is that you could go on google and there are just endless array of you know scholarly articles you can go through about cannabis and it's almost like you know it was never illegal <laughs> yeah exactly right and we certainly all stand on the shoulders of giants like Rob Clark and people who did early contributions and it makes me wonder were there any people in India who you looked up to as a bit of a role model or who was doing work kind of when you were in your kind of more junior stages of things um i i would say in the early life <clears throat> there were some but it was not related to cannabis especially uh, specifically so uh 
my mother belongs to the chamoli district and chamoli district is actually the place where the chipko movement started now i'm going to talk a little about chipko movement what is chip chipko movement was uh it, it was like a f- environment and feminism kind of a mix kind of a movement so they were cutting down trees in northwestern himalaya so all of these tribes in that includes uh, you know uh, the one my mother hails from they would go and they would stick to the uh, trees they would hug them now chipko means to like stick to something or to hug something okay in hindi so that was the chipko movement so they would go and they would stick to the trees and hug them and like ultimately that would uh, you know enable uh, make it you know impossible for the people to cut it down so i mean i we've heard, i mean i was not around in 70s but i definitely heard great stories of you know our ancestors you know helping in that movement on the other hand from my father's side you know one of my uncles and you know he's he's pretty famous and he has been you know presented award by the government as well for his work around the environment his name is jagat singh jungli jungli basically means the guy who comes from the, the jungle guy right in hindi so he has been given this uh uh salutation in a way jungli his name was jagat singh and you know we call him jungli that because this guy uh, alone himself planted an entire forest one day after the other by bringing plants one uh, he would sometimes take 10 plants sometimes take 20 plants and in a barren place he was able to make a full fledged forest which is now inhabited by a variety of you know uh, animal and you know birds and insect insect species and you know he was ultimately awarded um, a great honor for doing such work around the environment and preserving these plant varieties which grew there so that has always uh, been you know a, a driving force for me that has kept me around the plant it it always to- something inside always told me that if it is something around uh, related to the plant that is you know that, that that's going to be what i'm going to do so i i think that has been a great great motivation i mean not that i want to like uh, you know bring that up to you know really legitimize anything but i mean that just something that is attached to my history and you know i'm proud of it yeah totally understandable that's that's a really amazing story and you bring up a really relevant point about the the destruction kind of of the natural habitats of these cultivars do you think people are really paying enough attention to this and are aware of the repercussions of that in america i mean uh, certainly yeah, i think uh, almost everybody understands and uh, when i say america because the community that i am in by and large i mean there are people from america and canada so basically i just considered that all americans and even south americans right and some europeans so uh, i think in europe it's even larger i'm sorry i i think because of the greenhouse seed company and you know some of the work they have done around the land race um the awareness has been a little more on the european side but because uh, you know all the uh, you know indian and you know the pakistani and the afghani people who are now you know coming on to these platforms uh with their land race varieties they they are more connected i feel with the the american part of the community so i think the larger wave of understanding is uh, coming from the american side of the community but uh, i think for the longest time the information has uh, been res- been residing in the european community and people people have been aware that you know this is something uh i mean this pres- preservation work is important and it needs to be done the only thing that <clears throat> sort of bothers me about that is that uh, there are some people are not going to really name anyone here because that really doesn't serve any purpose but uh, some people you know who have been to india and you know they have collected seeds and all they have ever done is they've just sold those varieties you know to people and made money they've never sent anything back to these people they've never spoken about them they've never spoken about their problems and they never even came back or are even in contact with these people apart from when they really need the seed so although these people have been around and you know uh, sometimes these people even you know feel the need uh, to assert the fact that you know they've been around for much longer but you know then but i don't i i i feel that you know just being around is just not enough i mean you you have to do something i mean you know you have to do something that makes a difference even if even if you've been doing for a month i don't care if you if you've done more if you've contributed more than you deserve uh you know to be at the forefront of the movement and you know especially the people who are whose intentions are inclined in in, in the right way because you know 
this thing is this thing is very delicate you know it can go wrong in so many ways i mean it's just not very hard to imagine right so uh you know we're very weary of the people you know we connect with them I and there were instances you know i i got in contact with some people you know we're not exactly the kind of people i would have worked with but well that happens i mean you know you you really understand you know that the human factor is going to play out you know sooner or later so eventually we're trying to figure out more ways to you know keep our rigor around preservation of the varieties so not only that uh, we have been you know able to sending these varieties out to people we're also preserving them ourselves which i feel that at least the people who are you know uh, you know selling them or what they're doing whatever they're sharing them they should they have a responsibility that if you're in a situation in a place where you can grow it you should grow it or if you can't then you can at least you know collaborate with someone outside you know who is in a legal state and is able to grow them and have them grow it because just keeping them shows that either you want to uh, really hoard it and you know uh, create some kind of pressure in the market or some weird thing or maybe you're just not bothered you you just say preservation and you don't really understand you know that uh, the preservation just like the charity begins from home yeah of course and i can understand why you would be concerned about that i guess it raises an interesting question and we had a few of our viewers ask uh, you know varying forms of the same question where they wanted to basically know as someone, let's just say, for example, in the Western world, you know, kind of the countries you mentioned, Canada, USA, Europe, stuff like that, someone who's living in those places, what can they do to help kind of preserve these regional strains? Is the best thing they can do try to get some seeds and do a reproduction and just make sure they're around or should they try to caretake for a strain? Should they try to get over to a village and actually physically help the village out? Like what you mentioned would be a nice thing if you went there initially. Like what's your thoughts? Yeah, there are a few things I would like to uh, talk here. I mean, <clears throat> the, the first thing is that I really want to I mean, take this opportunity because you reminded me and want to thank the global community, especially from Australia, New Zealand, Europe and very specifically from America because they have been nothing but supportive for the last five years. I mean, if it were not for the community, I mean, the global community, you know, has helped and supported, uh, you know, we can't even like imagine doing one percent of what we're doing. Now, uh, what people can do, there are so many things people can do. I mean, you know, you could just take a plant, you could grow it. And, you know, if you could show it to 10 people, even if you don't reproduce it, let's say you don't want to keep a male because you have your OG and cookies going at the same time. So you want to make sure it's safe. So even if you grow a lander is female and you show it to 10 people, then you might show it to someone, you know, who may be a little more interested. And then he would go on to get those seeds and, you know, grow a male and a female and preserve it. So the, the point being is not what you have to do. The, the, uh, the point being that you... Uh, you have you have to feel that it uh, that it's it's priority that you have to first of all understand that there is an urgency. This is uh, that th this is not uh, you know uh, like women are getting oppressed, um, which has been happening for like thousands of years and would go on for a thousand more. I mean, this is something which is happening now and it's gonna end very soon and then there will be no more of it so we have to understand the urgency around this the preservation effort has to be a little more than what it is right now but i think we're on the right track the attitude is uh, absolutely fantastic in you know global community for about preservation people just have no second thoughts they understand this is important but what people are missing on is just just talking about it just going making comments and you know liking pictures and saying oh this is the best thing that's not really helping anything what you have to do is that you have to get hold of something get get hold of some seed not trying to say that buy it from me or like from some of my friends get it from anywhere you can get it from grow it preserve it in a way get a male and a female you know this is i'm talking about the very basic what you could do and you know you could preserve it make some notes you know uh, when when it grew what were what was it like you know it, how much time did it take and you know, what it smells like and all the other aspects and that information becomes part of our collective consciousness our collective knowledge about the land race and heirloom varieties which to be honest is very scarce right now okay there are, we don't know anything about land race and heirloom varieties i mean most of the questions we have to say i don't understand and you know i'm not trying to say that that is because we don't really understand the whole thing in a very comprehensive manner as we do most of the other things. 
So uh, first of all, we have to ensure, we have to take every path possible to add to the collective understanding of the land race and heirloom varieties. And that could be as simple as growing one plant in your house, making all the notes about it, and you know disseminating that information among at least with 10 people. The second would be to motivate other people. You know, sh- uh, if you are, you know, smart enough, if you're that intelligent guy who understands, you know, the importance around the uh, preservation, then it's your responsibility to go out to ten other people and, you know, let them know about it. At least make an attempt to, you know, um, put things into perspective and, you know, uh, show them why this is really important and why this is not just a uh, you, you know, another uh, heated agenda on the horizon. Well, and then there are other people, you know, who are more capable, who have bigger farms, they have more resources. So those people should definitely be supporting these groups and, you know, support anyone, you know, I don't care. I mean, like it's me or anyone, but uh, support these guys. I mean, because, you know, uh, th- that's the only way, I mean, you can make sure that they stick around. Otherwise, uh, you know, it, it can be hard for a lot of people. I can say that. And, you know, because you guys have the resources and I'm now I'm talking about these people who have big farms and resources to put behind the plants, they should be growing more of it. They should be the ones who would be who should be selecting these and they should become these new people. I mean, you know, you know how there is this uh, variety that goes around in uh, uh, USA. I might be wrong. It's called I don't know. I don't remember the name of some kind of OG Kush, I think maybe. Let's just say some OG or some something which is very good, which was selected by. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's like called 78 OG FE. I don't know something like that. So somebody that that tells me at least it te- it's telling me somebody in 1978 got some Afghani seeds and he was uh, you know intelligent enough and resourceful enough to grow a lot of them and then select a really nice plant that has made it down you know 30 years down uh, you know uh, down the pipe and now everybody can enjoy that, but. Won't we want to have more of that? Won't we want? Won't we wish there were like so many other more people? I mean, that way everything would have been, you know, preserved. I mean, isn't this the most, uh, you know, regretted thing ever by people that I wish people had, you know, saved the haze. I wish people had saved the skunk or like whatever else, you know. Isn't this the the biggest regret in the community right now? And if if you look at the nature of that concern, the nature of the concern is that, you know, we weren't vigilant enough to preserve the things that we thought are good. We knew these things were good. We still did not preserve it. So if anything, you know, if if anything's going to wake us up, then it's only going to be our own history, which may be as short as like 30, 30, 40 years. I'm talking about the cannabis, cannabis community. But there are so many lessons to be learned that the things we lost, why we lost them and how can we make sure that whatever is present now is not lost. So again, for the people who think that these things will not be lost, well, consider this. I mean, even in America where, you know, things, uh, you know, are so much more stable and everything, there were varieties which were really good and then they got lost. So, you, you know, I mean, there is a very good possibility. You, uh, this this thing is not gonna exist in like five to seven years. I mean, I, I could tell you right now, I mean, I'm, some of them will, but most of them would be gone. And if not gone in a way that they're eradicated, then those varieties would not be the same because like you mentioned earlier in the podcast that, you know, it's only a matter of time that some people do get those seeds and and they get mixed up. It's all done for. So let's do what we can do now. I mean, instead of, you know, telling our kids stories about these varieties, let's give them the seeds. Let's give them the actual plants. Yeah, perfect. What a what a brilliant answer for what people can do to get on board and help out. I think this would actually be a fantastic time for you to maybe just explain for maybe the few people who aren't aware who's a part of the Indian Land Race Exchange and like where they could get your seeds from and just some stuff like that if they want to help out. Okay. Um, so Indian Land Race Exchange is a collective uh, that really looks after a few different, uh, you know, collectors. And, you know, if they need some kind of uh, help that is related to seeds, uh, you know, because that also helps them in a way that financially, uh, just, let me just elaborate a little more. Like I went to Manipur this December and I, and I was alone and I went there and I got, uh, you know, a few hundred thousand seeds from there. So I don't need that many seeds. So what I do is I pass along some of those seeds to my friends and they have different pages on Instagram and they can, you know, sell some of those seeds and whatever. Uh, you know, money resource they get in turn, they can then use it 
for the next year tours or for you know growing the plant that they're growing in India and you know just continue the whole thing right so we work I, I basically work in that way and what I have is I have two immediate uh, people who work with me one is archaic serpent he's on instagram as archaic serpent rap realms i think and he's the guy who's from kashmir and you know he, he he does all the stuff from kashmir basically for me and then i have another guy that's named red giant he's on uh, instagram as red giant 92 he's uh, he's the grower he pretty much grows everything for me uh, i mean and he's a brilliant Grower, he grows a lot of hybrids as well. You know, he sells that. He does a lot of stuff. So this is the immediate team, and then we have further extension like Indian Hair, uh, Indian Heirloom Seed Company, who's a great friend of mine and who lives in Bombay, and you know, he uh, he has these uh, unique varieties as well, and you know, we collaborate. Sometimes I give them some of the varieties I have, and you know, he moves them uh, so that you know it helps the community as a whole, so we can lift everyone. And yeah, I mean, that, that's pretty much it. I mean, like then there are other accounts, uh, like I, I can name, I mean, uh, there's my friends from Alana, the Landrace Mafia, I'm sorry, because I can't really, uh, you know, remember them, Landrace Mafia. So these are uh, like young kids. And one of the kid actually was on the cover of Dope Magazine along with me. Uh, you know, because uh, these guys have a great relationship with, you know, villagers in Milana. So, you know, they have they have uh, helped us a lot, you know, get access to the M Milana village in the Milana region. So later on, you know, I thought, you know, they were talented enough that they should be, you know, leading their own project. And I, you know, really motivated them that you should be, you know, try to uh, put out some of the varieties uh, from your friends from Milana. And they're just doing just that. And they're also trying to get to these uh, different places, you know, and trying to get hold of the other seats. And of course, you know, the uh, Afghani guy, Baba879, I mean, you know, he's nothing short of an icon, of course. And it was really interesting, you know, that in 2018, I, I met with him over Instagram and, you know, I tried to get seeds from him, him and the seeds got seized in the mail because we had no idea that they will get seized. And what I had to do was I had to actually flew him over to India along with the seeds. And that's really was the first time how I got the got hold of the Afghani seeds, which were released in, I think, April 2018 to the community. And then since then, he has been able to expand his work beautifully. And, you know, he now has access to a lot of, uh, you know, European and, you know, American seed banks as well who sell his, uh, you know, seeds. So that's fantastic in the way that things have evolved in the past few years for everyone. So uh, this is basically the small team that we have. I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of people from America that I want to name, but if I start naming them, I mean, you know, we would need like four or five more hours to complete that. But I'm just gonna speak about like maybe two or three people who have played um, <clears throat> important role. Uh, of course, uh, you know, I've uh, been motivated a lot by uh, Mr. Bodhi, you know, because he even came to India, you know, for the fair, for the Kumbh Mela, and, you know, we hung out together for a couple of days. I mean, he's this amazing guy, uh, you know, you know, tells you all these uh, crazy stories from South America about DMT and all that. <laughs> so it was, it was really cool. And, you know, he, he gave me so many seeds. I mean, uh, uh, right now I'm working with some of the varieties. Uh, some of the varieties that I could not get, like Pakistani Chitral Kush and, you know, the Kandahar Black. So he, he got it to me and they're like amazingly inbred as well. So like most of the work is done. So, yeah, he, he's been a great help. And then, you know, I have another friend. I don't know if you know him. He's known as BioVortex, Jesse Dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I met Jesse. Yeah, he's he's probably one of my best friends from America. I mean, he's he's one of the best guys. He's helped me so much. I mean, you know, we're almost speaking on a weekly basis and we're doing this conference and we're discussing, you know, sometimes that I'm writing, you know, some of these articles and papers I have to share with him and, you know, uh, so that he can you know, do some, you know, critique on that. So uh, it, it's, re it's really great. I mean, because, see, the most needed thing here is the motivation. The only thing you need to make sure that people keep doing what they're doing is by making sure they're motivated. And, you know, these are the people that I'm naming right now. They have, they're motivating me. Then I have another friend, 
his name is uh, is he's, he's by Dr. Grinsky, I think, on the in Instagram. That's how he pronounces it. And you know, he helps me a lot for like sending money to country like Pakistan and Afghanistan because see. We can't send money to Pakistan because we have a very difficult relationship with them, okay, politically. And I'm sure you know that, like everybody knows that. So sending money there is like, if you want to get arrested, you do that. So <laughs> I have to, yeah, I have to route that money through them. And just imagine it, you can't find people in America who's going to risk their ass, you know, and send money to Pakistan because it's just pretty similar for them as well, right? And I'm not trying to say that someone is bad or uh, you know some country is bad or good by that. I'm just saying how things politically are right now. Okay, so he helps me. He went. He goes out of his way and he makes sure that he's sending big amounts of money to Pakistan, which is perhaps risky even for him to do that. But he does that because he want to make sure that this thing is you know done. The whole circle is completed. And he also was receiving seeds for me because if I try to get seeds from Pakistan, they get busted. So I have to get them to America and then I have to get it. I have to get those seeds from America to India. So, I mean, he's been helping wow. me and he's and yeah, he's a busy guy. I mean, you know, it's not like he's not a busy person. He's a very busy person. He has several projects of his own and, you know, so much work, but he makes sure that he takes out some time. So like I said, the preservation or the helping doesn't necessarily needs to come in the form of you buying seed or you growing them. It can be so many things that you could enable other people to do or put them in a situation where they could do more for themselves and ultimately, you know, contribute to the larger community. And these are people. And one more person I want to name is uh, would be, uh, I don't know his name. I never asked him. Asked him. Uh, I think he's mass medical strain. So I don't know his real name, but he's a fantastic guy, you know, absolutely amazing. We have lovely conversations around the plant, very spiritual kind of conversations and very philosophical as well. And, you know, we agreed that uh, I had a plant, you know, uh, uh, you know, that I feel was really special and, you know, I didn't have enough seats to release to everyone because then some people really get angry because there are very few seats and I can't get them to everyone. So what I did was I uh, just reproduced like a bunch of seeds, about like 100, 150. And then I gave the F1 seeds to, you know, Mass Medical. And I told him like, hey, you know, you can grow them and you're going to find like the sativa ones and like the indica ones, like the, you know, tall ones and the short ones as you want to classify them. And you can either segregate them into different you know, tangents and breed them separately, or you could just amalgamate everything and just make a very homogeneous mix of everything and, you know, just distribute it to people and put it into people's hand. And, you know, he's uh, he's a great grower and, you know, he makes, uh, you know, a lot of seeds available to a lot of people through a lot of, you know, American seed bank and menus. So I thought I should give it over to him and he would be the more responsible and better person to work with it. And, you know, he's doing it and he's again, that's just another unique way how, you know, he's contributing to the big effort. And I'm really thankful. There are some people who are helping me in the library project as well. There are some people from Aficionado Estate uh, and no, I can't remember the name. Uh, she, she, she's a woman and, you know, she's helping uh, Tory Gates and she's, she's helping me a lot with the library project as well. We are going to make a cannabis library in Himalayas in where in my hometown and you know we're going to put together a lot of agriculture related books and cannabis related books and she's been helping me collect all these books donations and you know uh, just helping overall with the morale and motivation you know so yeah lots of help and like I said there's so many other people I want to talk about but you know it's just not practical to do that but these are the people I can think of really who are involved in the movement uh, movement with us in a larger way and are making a difference. Yeah, what a really comprehensive answer. And I mean, you brought up a favorite of the show, Bodhi. Everyone loves Bodhi. That's a bit of a common sentiment. <laughs> um, and yeah, you know, it's so funny you mentioned that. I was only talking to Mass Medical Strains just yesterday about just general stuff and he brought up that collab you were doing. And so I wanted to know, what can you tell me about the Swabi line you sent him? It looks really cool. And do you hope to do more collabs going forward? Um, yes, the Swabi line is, is a really special one and for a few different reasons. <clears throat> so uh, if, if I talk about my father's side of the family, they were not necessarily from India. In 1947, India and Pakistan became two different countries. And at that point in time, my, my father's family, you know, 
they moved from Pakistan and they used to live in Swabi. They moved to Rajasthan and then from Rajasthan they moved to Uttarakhand where they found the you know environment was pretty much similar to where they had come from and they kind of settled there. And after a couple of generations, you know, everybody was speaking the language and they had completely, you know, become a part of the larger, uh, you know, Garhwali or the Uttarakhand culture that there is. So I was able to make a friend in 2000, or I think it was around end of 2016 in Pakistan. And, you know, he sent me some seeds from Swabi and that was really special for me. I kept those seeds in refrigerator for a very long time. And in 2019, I brought them outside when I had the resource and I was sure that if I grow them, I can, you know, like make sure that, you know, I flower them and I make the seeds and do everything that is required to reproduce and preserve it. So I grew a few of those. And what I did basically was I excluded all the longer flowering, you know, females, uh, which were uh, present in the population. And I just only selected the ones which are flowering faster and had copious resin production. I used two different males. One male had an amazing uh, vigor. The other male didn't have great vigor, but it had visible, uh, you know, trichomes on it. So, I mean, that was a plus. So I wanted to use it and see if that really translates into something else. But it surely does because uh, when I grew the F1s here uh, last uh, last year, then I saw that you know, uh, most of the F1s that came up, they were just way more resinous than what I had originally selected that population out of. So uh, <clears throat> for that reason, it's a very interesting population. But now uh, the question is why there are some short flowering and why there are some longer flowering varieties within that one population, and especially if it is domesticated in a place like Pakistan. Well, the answer is that Swabi is a place which is like really at the edge of uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa near like Mardan and Punjab. So while you're just, it's sort of a place while you're like getting down from the mountains and you know, you're going towards more hotter, more temperate climates, uh, which are also flatland territories, okay? So you have uh, the, the wilder varieties which are growing out there are pretty much similar to the Indian varieties, which are thin leaved and you know, they flower like 14, 15 weeks and you know, the, they, seem to have a very unpredictable way of producing THC, CBD or whatever. So uh, what people did in Swabi was just like everyone else in Pakistan, you know, they, they got their seeds from Afghanistan or some place like Uzbekistan where they can get the seeds uh, which, you know, grow plants that flower very short and, you know, have all those desirable effects that we know of from the short flowering varieties. But the problem was what they did not account for was once again, the wilder population growing around it. And because there's no one stopping that, they keep interacting with, with each other. Um, however, if you see uh, on an overall basis, the flowering still remains short and, you know, uh, the, the resin production is pretty much there because, uh, because, you know, the domesticated population after all is being taken care of, even though it is getting pollinated uh, with the one uh, which is wild. And of course, the wild variety uh, is the farthest thing from a true breeding variety. While your domesticated one isn't either a true breeding variety exactly, but it still is a little more homogeneous than the other ones. So it tends to dominate overall. But you still see a lot of, I mean, you know, longer flowering plants, not to the extent that 14, 15 weeks, but yeah, about like 11, 12 weeks, you see them and you see they have a significantly more stretch. And as a matter of fact, I would say even the ones that you would consider, uh, you know, short flowering or indica in a way, uh, even they have significantly more stretch compared to a pure Afghani variety or a pure variety brought from a place like Uzbekistan. So a lot of diversity going in there and the smells are just amazing because uh, you'll be getting a lot of spices. I mean, uh, that's the thing about uh, Pakistan. A lot of varieties that come from Pakistan have this spicy flavor and it's just delectable i mean you just fall in love with it absolutely so the spice is going to be there in an overwhelming fashion and it's going to be coupled with like raw mango and even mass medical told me that you know he was getting some rubbery tones and something like onion um so well let really let's see you know how it really develops and you know because he's really growing and growing them out big and yeah, we'll, we'll really see and I'm uh, really excited to uh, see how they test and what kind of phytochemical composition comes up. 
you know, number wise, uh, if there is some CBD present or even some other rare, uh, you know, cannabinoids present in that plant. So that all remains to be seen. But uh, so far, the developments are good. And Mass Medical has also gone ahead and, you know, uh, taken the opportunity to pollinate uh, some of his, uh, you know, stable varieties with Swabi and, you know, eventually work on those lines and see if he can release some of them. So it's gonna be it's gonna be great for people. Well, I, I'm always open for you know collaboration, uh, but uh, like I said, you know there's a, this big factor, human factor, you know that we have to be careful about. So we have to be careful, you know, who we're working with and that our intentions are in tune, and then we both have the same goal in mind, and not that you know one person is thinking something and the other person is thinking something else. There are so many varieties that I have, you know, which I, I cannot release because that's not. Uh, you know, good numbers, but eventually I'll find people, you know, good people who will, uh, who would be responsible enough to take them and reproduce, preserve, and then distribute them uh, to the community so that everybody can enjoy them. Yeah, yeah that's, that's really exciting. And I think likewise, we're going to wait and see all the awesome stuff to come from that collab. I'm interested to know, do you have a certain type of breeding style you like? And by that, I mean, do you like to cross different land races together? Do you prefer to just reproduce them and just kind of hunt within the one line? What's your preferred kind of way of doing it? Well, um, because, see, uh, I mean, I'm not a trained breeder or, I mean, because I've been only doing it for a few years. But, uh, I mean, I've had a background in science and, you know, I also studied, uh, you know, cognitive psychology. I mean, I have a master's degree in that. So we've done a lot of, you know, uh, you know, research and we understand how the research methodology, you know, works. So that pretty much remains the same wherever you go, even though, you know, plant breeding is quite a different thing when you compare it to, uh, you know, other things like psychology. But uh, if you are curious and you understand, you know, how to perform experiments to reach and at different conclusions, how to form hypotheses and, you know, how to prove and disprove them yourself is eventually going to help the, help you, uh, you know, get at positions where you know more than, uh, you know, somebody who is just looking at the plant in a much simplistic manner. Now, uh, there are a few different things that I like to do. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm a really fan of like pedigree breeding, but that's more for like the monoecious varieties, you know, which has male and female on the same plant. So it pertains more to that because you could self-pollinate those in a way, you know, uh, which is not really conducive for uh, um, varieties like cannabis. I mean to say, <clears throat> so if, even in cannabis, you could do that. So basically what that means is you're going to trace the pedigree. So all the characteristics that you see in a hybrid, uh, okay, let me just start over. I mean, if you have, uh, let's say two plants that you cross together, you have two land races. Let's say I have Kandahar black and I have PCK and I cross them. So what is gonna happen is that uh, I'm gonna see the uh, progeny and the progeny will have a few different things, okay? it's. It, What's, what it's going to have is some of the progeny is going to look like the male, some of them going to look like female, and some of them will have a co-dominant expression, which will be an amalgamation of both of the parents in varying manners. But when you're working with varieties which are highly inbred, which have been homogenized uh, for certain traits, like I'm going to talk about Pakistani Chitral Kush. Now, Pakistani Chitral Kush has, uh, is so inbred, I mean, that and it's so homogeneous for that trait or uh, I mean the way it grows and everything that no matter what you cross it with it just completely takes it over it, it, it just it just knocks off the other uh, you know alleles and just, just just takes over completely and I don't know about the Kandar black but I grew only about like five to seven plants and I could see that almost every plant was identical in the way they would acquire you know colors and you know way they would uh, you know, grow in a lot of things. So that made me understand, I mean, again, this is also a very inbred variety and pretty homogeneous for the trait black leaf, if not anything else. So I just thought, you know, we, you just cross these two varieties and the predictability is going to be really high. So for someone who's working in small spaces like me, I mean, I don't have like fucking farms here, like I'm growing plants at but I have enough space to, you know, do my breeding work in a meticulous and in an honest manner. So I have to readily choose plants or the parents uh, when I will be able to greatly predict the outcome because 
I don't have really have the space to see what's happening every time by growing 200 plants. So when I run into varieties like Hindu Kush, let's just say when I was growing Hindu Kush, and the first thing that I saw was, again, that there, there are these three different you know expressions there. The first is a narrow leaf that corresponds to the primordial state of that plant because they were all narrow leaf before they got dom- domesticated and everything. And then you have the domesticated variety, which is, of course, of course, the broadleaf variety, you know, the perfect structure and everything that we recognize as the cannabis plant. And then there is intermediate variety, which is just between both of them. It has, you know, certain features from both of those varieties in varying manners. So as soon as I saw that, I was, I thought if I'm, if, if I want the narrow leaf trait to carry on into my projects, then I can't just take this very plant and, you know, start, uh, you know, crossing it to everything else, because this is a part of a very, uh, you know, uh, a very heterogeneous, uh, you know, population. I mean, it's just not something, you know, which is consistent. It's not dominant in the population. If it were dominant, then I would see it pop up a lot more often, like the broadleaf. So, uh, then the only option you have, then it's not really a matter of what you like to do. The only option you have is to take that plant, you know, and find another plant, you know, its counterpart, which is as closely related to it physically in other aspects, smell and all as you can. And then you start inbreeding them selectively. And you do that until you reach a you know, situation where almost every plant comes out like that. It happens in four generation, five generation, who knows, depends on the variety, depends on, you know, how well you're selecting it and a lot of the things. So once you do get to that point, then you have once again reached a situation of that PCK into Kandhar kind of a situation, because now you have a Hindu Kush variety that is going to act as a true breeding variety because it has been, you know, homogenized for all of those traits in it over generations by selectively inbreeding it with closely related individuals. Now, if I take that Hindu Kush and I cross it with something else, then I can be sure that these traits will show up in a overwhelming proportion in at least in the F1 generation. And then the selection work is going to be, you know, really easy or you could just, you know, cross pollinate the F1 generation, get to the F2, you know, and then select from an even more diverse population. But then again, there is no fixed rule. There are no rights and wrongs. You can cross land races to land races. You can cross land races to hybrids. You can do whatever you want, right? You will end up making seeds. Some plants will come out of those seeds. But if you want to work in a way, you know, that is predictable and uh, th- that uh, kind of creates like a feedback loop that your own work has to give you a certain feedback that what you were expecting, yes, you're able to see that. Like, for example, again, if the Kandahar Black and PCK uh, cross does not show an F1 population, you know, what I'm expecting to see, then that tells me that something went wrong in the parental generation. Then I can go back and, you know, I can figure it out what it is, although I'm pretty sure that's not going to happen. But uh, what I'm trying to say here is that it really depends on where you're trying to reach. So if you want to reach somewhere uh, where you want to be confident in giving out your seeds and letting people know what they would be like, then, well, that's the way of working that you have to either find true breeding varieties or you have to find varieties and, you know, make them breed true for, you know, traits by inbreeding them and just a lot of work. I know, but, you know, it has to be done. And I understand, I mean, the market situation is completely different for people in US and Europe because they're constantly, you know, competing with so many other people. And, you know, uh, so the actions are pretty much predicated by, you know, uh, what's market, what market is doing, what what's good in the market more than what they want to do. And it's kind of sad at the same time, but, you know, people have to put food on their table. So, I mean, I, I'm not going to go ahead and blame someone for like, uh, not doing the work that way should be done. But at the same time, there are, there are no rights or wrongs. I mean, you do what you, you can do, and then you try to reach at a place where people can appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Understandably, people have got to provide for themselves and their family. Just to kind of tie up two little things I was wondering about your breeding process, do you given what you just said, do you tend to like to select just one male to pollinate females or do you like to use a few? And then as a follow-up, do you keep any cuttings at all, either male or female? 
Um, I, I I like to select a few males uh, always. I mean, at least uh, three, four, or five, depending on the population as well. If I mean, it again, it really depends what you're trying to do. So uh, let's let's say if I'm working with Lolab Valley, that I and my friend Archaic Serpent were. So we saw there is a staggering amount of variability present within the larger population. So we had no option, but we had to select five different males. They look completely different. And then we had to narrow it down to one, which took around like three months of just stressing those males and just trying to see if there's any you know latent intersex trait that might pop up later. So all of those things. So it really depends what I'm trying to do. But if I'm working with, let's say, PCK, then I don't really need to have like 20 different males, really. I mean, it, 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 it doesn't really make a lot of sense, but I'm sure you could, uh, you know, increase the probability of your results in, in, a, in a better way if you have more males. And I do understand that, but uh, I think a more, uh, I, I think a more, uh, what I should say, uh, a more in tune way with your process, or uh, I would say a more a way that would you know take you towards your goal has to be uh, taken by people rather than what would appeal to people as you're doing good because i see that some people would go and do things because they feel that you know this would uh, drive people's opinion in us uh, you know in a certain way and it would make them feel that i'm doing the right things but i think you always and always have to choose over uh, you know you have to choose what you want to do over what would drive other people's, you know, uh, opinions. And then you could, I mean, it's, it's very hard to explain in words for me. I mean, English not being my first language, I guess. But um, what I'm trying to say here is this, that, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the male selections, I mean, it's difficult. I mean, you know, because most people, you know, who are growing, like selecting 20 males, they never tell you like what they're selecting for and how they're selecting. Because I see some people say that, you know, if your male, you know, uh, drops the pollen late, then that's a good male or you have to find a male that has a big cluster on it. All valid and, you know, they make sense, you know, all of them. But uh, I don't see people like, you know, uh, when they're working with a population that taking notes of the females, you know, the females you like. If, if let's say you like four females, you know, in a population, then you have to take notes from the beginning that what is the you know difference between their internodes, you know, their life their leaf surface area and all of those things. And when you will be finding males, that exact thing is going to help you. That data is going to help you determine which are those males which will be perfect, which will be synonymous to the females that you have selected. Instead of just relying on something like a bigger, you know, cluster on the male or, you know, it has a dank stem rub or something of that sort, which is great. I mean, you should do that. But I mean, if you're maintaining data from your female selections, then you can just take that physical data, apply it to the male and see which males have that exact structure and every, all those traits. And you know, these plants are the closest to the females you've selected and you, know, you could do that. So I think more than in numbers, uh, it, it is about how to select the male then, um, that 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 is more important because you could have 10,000 males and yet not have a clue how to select the right one. Yeah, very astute point to make. And I mean, you know, while we only just talked about Bodhi just a minute ago, I want to use him as a good little segue into my next question, which is when you kind of travel around and you go and visit different places, do you predominantly trek between them? or And is that like a, a style of travel that you enjoy? Because I just, I just remember Bodhi's so fond of it. Yeah, we, we have to trek. I mean, most of these places are not accessible by um, <clears throat> by roads. So uh, most of the places you have to track. So um, uh, Himachal Pradesh is uh, fairly easy because um, you get, uh, if you want to go to the Malana, you get to uh, uh, to the last point with your car and then it's only about two kilometers to the village and two kilometers to, you know, Waichin Valley and about another kilometer to Magic Valley. Uh, Wailing Valley is a little farther. It's about like eight to nine kilometers and everybody's not even welcome there. So, I mean, like most people don't go. But apart from that, I mean, it's pretty much easy. But you go to places like Uttarakhand or, you know, northern Kashmir, then there's a whole lot more, you know, walking involved because the roads are just not paved. Those places are not getting the kind of revenue and tourism Himachal Pradesh is getting. And, you know, 
uh, the development is, uh, I mean, pretty much, uh, you know, in sync with that. I mean, as much the revenue the state's going to have, I mean, they will only be able to spend that and sometimes not even that. So uh, Kashmir and Uttarakhand, it's going to be really taxing. I mean, if you're not the kind of person who likes to walk, then you're going to have a very hard time. And because of the altitude, uh, I mean, it's really difficult. And, you know, I have met some people who have come from like America. I mean, I had this guy in 2018, he's a good friend of mine. And uh, he came from America and we took him to, you know, Uttarakhand and, you know, I took him to Kashmir and I took him to, you know, uh, Himachal Pradesh as well in Malana. And, you know, he had a great time, but again, it, it, it got really taxing and tiring for that person because, you know, he was just not, uh, you know, used to walking a lot on a daily basis. So, and another thing is when you're doing this, you have a very short window, like you have this window of 15 September to sort of like 30th October, because <clears throat> most of the harvest is going to happen between that. And you have to make it out to all of these places, at least to the three Himalayan states and have to be present there, you know, while it's going down. So it's it's important to, you know, plan very meticulously how you're going to go about your, uh, you know, hunts every year so every year we make a calendar at least four months prior at least five months prior and we know that you know what places we are going to go to this year and what exactly are we going to cover and uh, you know if you're going to make some kind of video like we did one in Kashmir you know we covered how, how they make hash traditionally by cooking it so we, we write a storyboard for that and we make sure that you know we know exactly what to do at that point in time because it's all happening live and if you miss it then you miss it so uh, you just have to be prepared and the presence of mind is of the essence uh, while conducting this kind of work. Uh, but uh, hiking and walking is, is basically a very integral part as well. And if you're not up for that, uh, you're probably going to have a very hard time. Understandable, of course. And when I think back to Bodhi talking about the trekking, he often speaks about it as though there's like a spiritual aspect to it and a lot of the cannabis and hashish you sample along the way is really special. Is that kind of the way you think about it or is it more just like a means to an end to get the seeds for you? No, absolutely. There, there is a deep spiritual aspect uh, attached to it. And I just want to be clear, and this has nothing to do with the religion or the God here. When we... When I'm saying spirituality, I, I just mean to say a higher understanding and a higher awareness uh, of you and your surroundings. And I think there are two very important things that happen when you go out on these tracks, especially if you're alone. First is that you are in a serene environment that is very hard to come by in you know, a chaotic life in, in places like India. So now you are in actually physically in a place or in a situation where you can reflect back to things in your life, reflect back to things that you see in nature and you can connect with them because there's nobody around you to, you know, judge you or to call you crazy or any of that sort of thing that we, you know, we seem to be really worried and preoccupied about. And the other aspect of it is the awareness of the surrounding. I mean, without going out in the nature, and you could call it data collection in a way, in a very crude manner. And you could also call it increasing the awareness of your surroundings. So both are correct. And, uh, you know, that can only happen when you're venturing to these places where there are no roads. Because, see, if there is a road somewhere, let's understand this, that place has already been ventured and you can probably find that information somewhere on Google, right? But if you go to places where you don't have a road and you're hiking into these mountains to these valleys well surely enough you're going to run into places and you're going to run into cultures and people and resin and you know alcohols and honey and you know sometimes they make uh, you know butter from indigenous milk and all that and all of those experiences you know you will always be devoid of that if you are not attempting to go there so if some person, especially somebody who lives in America or lives in a country where, you know, these kind of experiences are scarce to come by and they do make a journey like that, I mean, what possibility do you think there is that you, it does not have a spiritual, deep spiritual impact on that person? I mean, you, you basically have to be like, you know, a non-human entity, I mean, not to be moved 
by the beauty of the nature that is present in Himalayas. I'm not sure if you've been here, but it's absolutely breathtaking. I mean, I've only lived all my life here. And every time I go, I'm just dumbstruck, you know, looking at the nature around me. So like you said, I mean, you know, Bodhi really, I mean, you know, puts it in a very eloquent manner <clears throat> that I might not be able to put it across in that way. But the gist of the story is, he he's just as interested in hiking and in the journey as much as he's interested in getting to the destination and then doing the thing, which is incredible. And that is the attitude that we need to have. And not because that it's something spiritual. At the same time, this is the same thing that is going to help you with your data collection. If you're aware and sensitive all the time, if you're receptive of your surroundings, when you're and you're hiking, you're not going by a motor car or by a bus. You know, you're walking slowly and you're taking information as our senses are evolved to. You know, at medium speeds, at medium uh, sizes then we will be taking a lot more in. We will be imbibing all this in raw data from nature. And because there are no roads, so we might be getting in, you know, more uh, or newer information, which you could then process in your own way, use your intelligence, what you make of it, and present it to the community, you know, who uh, are not geographically blessed enough to be in those places so frequently. And, you know, that's really what, what it's all about so i think he, he puts it in a very beautifully and and a very simple sim, puts it very simply but there is a deep deep meaning to that i think yeah most certainly and i mean Bodhi actually gave me two questions to ask you so we may as well roll into him seeing as we're here and he wants to know first off what's the most psychoactive indian heirloom strain you've been able to try okay the most uh so the most i mean this is this is a this is a tricky question but i'm going to say manipuri the one that comes from northeast of india manipur and especially the one that we recently got from uh, eastern manipur burma border and i i don't understand the reasons why because you know again the domestication is pretty much you know uh, of the same standard as it is in rest of the north india but the varieties that seem to come from these uh, places northeast of India seem to have a really, uh, you know, uh, intense high, if, 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 if not more. And I have a little theory, and this might be wrong, but I'll just tell you what I think about this. What I think about this is uh, the, the eastern part of India is where, uh, which is like quite close to the equator, you know, south and the east part, the southeast part, where Orissa is and Andhra is. And... Um, those places are very close to Northeast India and Northeast India is also close to the Northwestern, you know, Himalayan regions. So it in a way is a sandwich between these two places. So it's, I mean, it could be that, you know, people from, you know, different places like East and North went out there, migrated, and they may have contributed somehow, you know, in what makes up the natural population out there today. But we also understand this as a matter of fact that, you know, the Mao tribes, uh, you know, of or you go, the, the Tankholes and they have descended uh, from the Burmese people and specifically the Burmese people of uh, the Tibetan descent, Tibetan Chinese descent. So that's the migration pattern that has uh, that, that has been traced and that they have been able to trace it because of the language, because of the way, uh, you know, the, the languages they speak and these are different dialects so they can understand that this dialect evolved properly from this one. So that really paints the picture of the migration for Northeast of India. So those people have come through the ways of China. So I don't know if they bring varieties from China or Tibet along with them and then it gets mixed along with the general population, which is just entirely different because of being in a very wet tropical like climate but it it seemed to have an amazing and unparalleled high at least if you uh, you know compare it to any other variety in india and kashmiris can be quite strong but um they're not psychoactive in a way i mean i, I wouldn't call them like they don't have that psychedelic kind of in, uh edge to them i mean they're more like a uh, th they're a different kind of high i mean which which could more be associated to like broadleaf plants but yeah, Northeast India varieties, Manipur, Eastern Manipur, Burma, and specifically, I think would be the most or the best in terms of high. 
Yeah, a really solid answer. And so the second question he asked was, do you think that the high elevation Himalayan cannabis differ in effect from the tropical, more sea level specimens? And do you think that it's because of maybe the UV that it creates a little something special? And the reason why he asked is because he said he knows of some barbers who just want to try to find cannabis from like the highest elevation possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I, I think we did bring this up in conversation somewhere previously that, you know, about the UV radiation, when I was speaking about the highland varieties, which also grow in the high, lot, high latitude regions. So they seem to be getting a lot more exposure of, uh, you know, UV rays than any other place in the world. So uh, is, that, uh, is that something that makes the plant behave in a different way phytochemically? I mean, I, I can't say yes or no to that because I don't have any tests to, you know, fall back on or any kind of study. But what I can tell you for sure is that the varieties that tend to grow at higher altitudes or, you know, high, high latitudes, especially, they seem to, uh, you know, they seem to produce, like we said before, a, de a, an in, uh, a competitively dense coverage of resin. And, you know, the resin gland, gland, glands seem to be bigger and, you know, it just seems to be more potent in the way, you know, overall in the way they uh, make you feel. And and this would, you know, encompass India in the way that I'm talking that when I say highland high latitude, that would include everything from Central to Southeast Asia. But in India itself as well, if you go to places like northern Kashmir, you know, with, uh, uh, it's at 34 degrees north and then you have altitude of like 3000 plus meters, which is more than 10,000 feet and you definitely see that there are certain plants uh, there, uh, you know, which are just insane to simply s say the least. So I think because those babas that Bodhi uh, is referring to, they have been to all of these places because these babas are just about getting, you know, getting to all the places, to heights of the mountains, to the lowest of the cities, you know. So, so they, they know, they know the higher up they out there is, uh, are the plant populations which seem to have, you know, bigger trichomes and, you know, larger uh, density of trichomes. So if you're rubbing the plants, you can probably get the same thing done within 10 minutes instead of doing it in an hour if you're working with those varieties. If you're working with varieties in lowland in places like Punjab, you may have to spend like three to four hours before you can get anything at all in your hands. So I think they tend to have that understanding, maybe not in a way that we would like to think about it, but, uh, you know, as always, uh, indigenous cultures and uh, these primitive cultures, they knew so much because they didn't have these distractions of, you know, all the societies and the markets and these phones and laptops and whatnot. So they could rely, they used to rely on their natal, their innate senses so much more often than we do. So, I mean, you know, we were just not able to, you know, think in, in, in those ways. So I think it's always a great idea to take advice from your elders and especially those elders see, happens to be some, uh, you know, chillum smoking baba. I mean, you know, uh, yeah. And, you know, Bodhi knows, I mean, what's up? I mean, he's been here, uh, you know, so many times in India. So he pretty much understands India very well because when he was here, I mean, uh, you know, he's not asking me that, you know, how to get around. So he pretty much knows everywhere. And in fact, when I was in the Mela, he was able to show me some of the things, um, you know, that I would, would have missed, I think. Wow. Yeah. I mean, what a testament to the guy. So just to kind of wrap up this section on kind of the little trekking stuff, what's one of the most memorable smokes you've had while doing the trekking around? And as a follow up, do you have any kind of crazy stories from while you were trekking? Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to answer that all in one. Uh, and this just happened now last year. So uh, last year around the month of uh, end of July or beginning of August, um, India made a huge change in the way, you know, the things are in Jammu and Kashmir. We kind of took hold of Kashmir entirely, our government. I'm not going to go into whether that's right or wrong. I mean, that's their thing. So. There was a lot of tension there, a lot of people. It was locked up for the longest time. And I was there before that happened. So it was like really hard for me to get out. But I got out somehow on the 6th of the August and I was home. 
Um, I was really, you know, thankful I was able to come back. But see, what happens is uh, three months down the line, things got a little eased up on 10th of October. They said, okay, we're going to open it for the tourists once again so you guys can come. And nobody's going to Kashmir. I mean, of course, nobody wants to die. And my friend is like, hey, so you guys are like coming over or what? And I said, I want to come, but I mean, the situation, I mean, aren't you watching the news and everything? And he's like, yeah, these news guys are crazy, man. There's nothing happened here. Just come over. They have officially opened for the tourism. Should be okay. I got the flight. I went there. We did the Srinagar thing. It was fantastic. Smooth sailing. We went to Dachigam National Park. Smooth sailing. Got all the samples, pictures, everything. Then we moved to northern Kashmir, and uh, I'm really happy. I'm going to the Lolab Valley, and I'm gonna go to those spots where you know my friend got the seeds last year, and I will get to see those in person as well. Now you have to uh, first of all let me put things in perspective a little bit. Lolab Valley is just like three to four hills away from Pakistan, okay? And not only that, it's at the border. That's a de facto border. What that means is that there is no actual border. It just assumed that there is somewhere a border in between and you just don't cross. So very often what happens is that you wouldn't realize and you would just cross over. And well, that would be, you know, a, a very bad story to tell in the end if you survive too. But we were there and, you know, we were rubbing hash. We were actually 12 people because we had an entire team from Lolab. I had like seven guys from Srinagar and some from the Lolab locals. And we were there, we were rubbing hash. And, you know, I was collecting samples. I made several videos and even posted that. When we were almost done and we were coming down, the, the there's an Indian army post there. All right, so they were, uh, they were wire, I mean, somebody uh, did a wireless to them that there are like about 10 to 12 people they can see on the top of the hill and they're like coming down. And as we were descending down in the first meadow that came, there were these two guys from SOG, that is Special Operation Group. And let me tell you something about Special Operation Group. I mean, they're just asked to shoot people if they think that they should be shot and no questions asked. So they had their guns and, you know, they, uh, they made us sit there and, you know, they everybody just went around telling them that how they are just from, you know, this local place. And even the guys from Srinagar had some relatives living in this place. So they were like almost all off the hook. I mean, it was natural for them. OK, so you guys are not coming from the Pakistan or, you know, something fishy. Then when they got to me and they asked me where I'm from and I told them that I've, I've come from Punjab. And these guys were absolutely they just absolutely lost their mind. They were like. Well, oh, man, like, are you not watching the news or like, do you not live in this world or what? Like you, first of all, you don't come to Kashmir in time like this. And if you do come to Kashmir, you stick to the lake or to the Srinagar, to the southern part. You don't freaking come to the northern Kashmir. And even if you come to northern Kashmir, and this is exactly how he said, I mean, not in English, but even if you come to Kashmir, northern Kashmir, then you don't climb up the mountain and you don't. Uh, try to you know get close to, uh, to the border region and like how dare you and he, he's like that I've been here for 10 years you know serving an army within just the Kashmir and I've never got my family here to show them around I've never had the courage to got my family here to show them around and look at you like what, what are you even doing here and then we just kind of told him like what exactly I was doing there and you know I had to tell him because you know I wasn't doing something that I wasn't proud of and the good thing there is like they're not the kind of they're not like police. So they're not worried about hash or weed. That's like none of their concern. Their only concern is the security that who are you? Where are you coming from? And why are you here when you're not supposed to be on top of these mountains? So that thing went on for about, I don't know, two, two and a half hours. And, you know, they scared uh, the shit out of me, you know. But at, I think at some point I had like kind of understood that they will eventually let me go because most of the guys that we were there with, not only that they were local, but their fathers are in army, you know, in certain different regiments. So that helps them, you know, build on the confidence that, OK, these people are not, you know, antisocial elements or someone who's here to do something bad. They're just young guys who want to smoke and, uh, you know. That was one incident. I mean, one hell of an incident. I mean, you're, you're just sitting there and they, they took our pictures, they took our IDs and they had this machine where they could scan our IDs and they figure out, you know, they could uh, you know, check that number with the uh, data government database, whether or not these are like uh, fake or these are like the real IDs. So they did everything that they could and they took our phone numbers, our addresses, 
And it was only after that that they let us go. The first thing I got down at the Lola Valley floor, I got into the car with my friend and we left and we only stopped at, I mean, Srinagar, not before that, it's about 120, 30 kilometers. Uh, although there were a lot of stoppages in between. So this is like a very usual thing for Kashmir that you travel like 10 kilometers, then you stop for the army and then it just happens like that everywhere. But that was, that would be one incident that I'm never going to forget and definitely something to be spoken about. Yeah, wow. Well, I think I would have been in the same boat as you, quite worried. So I'm only just in this moment realizing that I haven't asked you at all. Do you in general tend to prefer like more kind of uplifting highs or more kind of sedating? I, I, like, I, I like more sedative highs. Uh, something, you know, that helps you relax because, uh, I don't smoke much during the daytime. I, I usually, you know, begin my morning and then I try to refrain from smoking till, you know, six or seven in the evening. And then I just gradually, you know, st uh, start hitting some bongs. But when I really feel an urge where, where I really feel an urge to smoke is when I'm, you know, going to sleep because I have some, you know, issues relating sleep. And, uh, you know, the, so, so I'm all, always just looking for varieties, you know, that can, you know, help me accomplish or help me, you know, just mitigate those uh, issues that I have around the sleep. So I'm always inclined towards finding varieties which are more sedative in nature and, you know, would make you feel sleepy, uh, which is also one of the reasons why <clears throat> I tend to, you know, get uh, some of my resin or cherries in bulk and, you know, try to cure it for the longer durations. Because then even if, you know, the plants naturally are not, uh, or plant predominantly do not produce, you know, a narcotic effect, uh, we can actually cure the hash in a way and, you know, get it to a point where it would induce that sort of sleepy effect. Yeah, I think I can certainly relate to many aspects of that answer. Something I wanted to ask you a little, about, a little bit about was kind of the general smoking culture in India. And I guess specifically, is tobacco normally mixed with cannabis? And as a follow-up, are there other things besides tobacco which ever get mixed with cannabis and smoked? Yeah, so tobacco is big, big, big in India. I mean, <clears throat> there is no, uh, you know, hash smoking or even weed smoking in India without tobacco. So, um, yeah, I mean, everybody smokes tobacco. It's not a matter of who or where. I mean, you could go to Himachal Pradesh, you could go to Kashmir and sure, they, uh, the brand of the cigarette is going to change or the brand of the tobacco is going to change, but they all want tobacco. I mean, it's, it's the bread, you know, that we are going to spread the jelly on, basically. So, uh, yeah, tobacco is a very integral part of our smoking culture everywhere, but there are a few other things that actually get mixed along with it. Uh, and opium would be, you know, one of the things that do, because we have a lot of Ayurvedic uh, um, opium, you know, preparations here in India. So just to be sure not to confuse this with heroin in any way, I mean, opium preparations as in like, uh, they're Ayurvedic, they're mixed with some spices. And then it becomes a medicine, actually, and it's uh, it's really beneficial. So we have uh, those getting mixed a lot with uh, you know cannabis often. But then again, the can uh, the tobacco has to be there. I mean, you know, without tobacco, you just cannot imagine. I mean, at least I cannot. I mean, uh, so if I smoke without tobacco, and I've tried, you know, because sometimes some people would give me that what do you call that dab. And it just feels incomplete, you know, if, if you're not smoking with tobacco. And I understand the underlying reason for that. I mean, you know, part of that is that you eventually get addicted to the, you know, uh, uh, substances in tobacco. But, I mean, if we were just to talk about the experience and the very typical Indian experience of smoking, then it it's just cannot be imagined without tobacco in any any place, no matter where you go in India. Yeah, that's that's understandable, and I'd certainly heard that. So, how do people tend to smoke? Do they use chillums? Do they use bongs? Do they use joints? What would you say is the most common? Uh, usually, people begin with cigarettes. I mean, they empty cigarettes and then fill them back up, <clears throat> you know, with the mix. And then usually, people graduate to smoking in joints. That is, they start buying, you know, rolling paper, 
And <clears throat> as people, uh, you know, tend to grow a little more older, and I'm of course not talking about everyone, but I'm just going to talk about the typical smoker, uh, you know, middle class, like a working class kind of a society that works in the ITUs and uh, relate, uh, software related jobs. So those people then after a while, they tend to lean more to gravitate more towards bong smoking because it's just more convenient and it's not that time consuming. You know, you could just smoke, get a good high and get on with your curriculum. So uh, I think that uh, contributes a lot uh, in people, you know, gravitating more towards smoking in bongs. Uh, the chillum is more like a, it's more like a pseudo connoisseur uh, environment in India uh, related to chillum. So while you have a lot of people, you know, who smoke in chillum and they have very expensive chillums as well, but um, more than often, and I'm not talking about everyone, of course, more than often I see people, they are using a smoking a chillum only because they would want the other person to see that they're smoking in chillum. And, you know, that that is supposed to, you know, give you a high ground in their opinion, I mean, amongst other smokers, I don't necessarily feel that way, but I can certainly see that, you know, uh, you know, in, in people. So while, I mean, uh, you know, ch uh, chillum smoking is morely culturally confined within the Babas, but the new generation that smokes in chillum, I think they smoke out of chillum more, that has to do more with um, either, you know, uh, either trying to, you know, uh, experience uh, if what Bawa's experience in a way, you know, or just to uh, be in a place where you have a, um, you know, moral high ground or just a high ground over everyone that you smoke in Chillam and other people smoke in Bong. It's, it's weird, but that's how it is. I mean, this is a thing in India, basically. So if you have like an Italian Chillam, you know, that costs like $200, and you're smoking in it, so you automatically become a connoisseur. I mean, you may not know anything about cannabis, but if you have a chillum, then whoa, man. Yeah, look out for this guy. And, you know, if, uh, if I'm just smoking uh, a joint, then, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, then you're just like everybody else. So immediately chillum will give you a status hike amongst the smokers in, in the circle. But does it does it have an intrinsic, you know, property to it? Uh, then I, I mean I'm not really able to see that to an extent that I can explain it and I don't much prefer to smoke in chillum a lot but when I go to Himachal Pradesh they have some absolutely lovely chillums and I indulge in that fully till my throat is you know uh, sacrificed but you know I enjoy <laughs> it <laughs> oh, I love that what a great answer so I guess just as a really quick follow-up is there that same kind of hype culture, maybe more particularly in the younger people, like what we see in America where, like, you know, they want to try to use it as a status thing. So, it's like, you know, I'm smoking cookies in my chillum. Look how cool I am. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, um, but there, uh, but in a much different way, I would say. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, yeah uh, okay. Uh, okay. The way this works in India would be maybe that if you go to Milana, like I said, if I go to Milana and I, I'm always like, you know, trying to smoke in different chillums and I'm not really trying to find a joint or just bong, just forget about it. So why, uh, why, why that happens is because when, when you're at a place, you know, uh, where it's a common practice, then, then uh, as a human nature, you know, we, we want to gel in, we want to fit in. And we, we don't want to be, you know, going around the village holding a bong and, you know, look different. Some people certainly like to do that, but most people would like to gel in. So uh, it has that aspect to it, uh, the, the, the chillum smoking and the high ground really uh, or, or, or the superiority that uh, that is imparted by owning a chillum or smoking in a chillum really comes from one that it costs a lot if it's an original Italian chillum and everybody knows that. And second is that it is it is almost as if assumed or you know presumed that if you have a very nice chillum, then you must have very nice hash too, which is not necessarily correct again because you know why. And I mean those are just really the things uh, you know why people tend to have chillums because of course you go in circle there are girls as well and you know you wanna you wanna look good right you wanna make sure that girls are like totally stoked on you. So, I mean, there are just so many reasons, but I just don't see it for the cultural reasons so much. 
so among the youngsters with that said there are certainly some uh, youngsters who are you know very dedicated and they would follow all the rituals you know pass it to the right and you know pray before you know uh, smoking it they take care of everything and i absolutely love to be with those people sometime and smoke but as you move out of those circles i mean most of the people you see are just the rich people you know who can afford to spend a lot of money and get hold of these things but they don't uh, actually appreciate them in a way that uh, you know a baba would do or another youngster is doing who is following all the rituals yeah of course and i guess understand or there's a natural kind of distribution there so one of the other things i noticed on your instagram that i wanted to follow up on which seems like it's kind of more of a local thing is that you posted a photo of what you said was a traditional kashmiri corn wrapped and baked hash please tell me a little bit more about this i would never even heard of that yeah so uh, that's a re- uh, really special one. In 2018, first of all, let's talk about, I mean, how that came to be, I mean, like how we were able to document it. So in 2018, <clears throat> I had got, invited my friend from USA to come and, you know, let's go to Kashmir and see if we can come back alive, right? So we went there and once we were there, um, uh, the guy that was supposed to take us around and my friend, Archaic Serpent, they said, you know what, we can actually arrange because we have material we can arrange for making hash right now. And if you want, you have mobile phones, you could like, you know, capture it and then it could be made into documentaries. So when I was in college, because, uh, you know, along with psychology, I also was part of, you know, mass, uh, you know, mass communication team. So I know a little bit of editing in softwares like, you know, Final Cut Pro and Sony Vegas Pro. So I thought, yeah, that's a great idea. I could just take that footage and I could make it into a small, you know, documentary or a short film kind of thing and show it to other people because, um, I mean, showing is always, you know, better than telling. So we we covered that and, you know, I myself didn't really know a lot about it, even though because I live in, I live near Kashmir, you know, so we often get uh, get that here. I mean, we, we, we get that kind of hash here, but we never tried to really, I mean, you know, reconcile that what this is and why would this hash be like this? And, you know, there's so many other things that could be thought of. So when I was there, it was happening in front of me and I was able to see the entire process. I was even like asking them the things that I could not, uh, you know, readily understand. So what this process is, it's very interesting. It's a mix of, you know, a few cultural phenomena a uh, few techniques which are apparently not from Kashmir has been brought, you know, from other countries like Afghanistan. And then you have a few things happening uh, which are really, really local to that place. So uh, how people usually go about it. So this is happening mostly in Srinagar in the southern Kashmir region. Okay, So uh, northern Kashmir, they're not doing it so much because it's really wet out there. In southern Kashmir, what they do is they don't have a uh, farm population of cannabis out there. So they would just go during the season. And as soon as they find a good plant, they break it. They break it and they leave it there. They break it, they leave it there and they mark the plants. They remember where I broke the plants and I have to go back to those places. After a few days uh, or a few weeks, they would go back with a big polythene and they would you know, then collect all of the material that's on those plants and just bring it back to a place where they're going to, you know, go about the rest of the process. And the first thing that is done is they just spread it out in the sun, let it dry, uh, let the material dry completely in case there's some water, uh, you know, or some moisture in it. Once it's completely dried, um, they just simply go about how uh, people usually or traditionally dry if They take a uh, they take a cloth and you know, tie it over a, a plastic uh, sort of like what do you call it? plastic sort of tub and then they just you know sieve the dry material over that uh, you know pile after pile and the resin is collected in the tub so that process is pretty much i mean similar to what you see in places like afghanistan and pakistan and i'm pretty sure this process has come from there but the interesting part and the part that is not seen or heard anywhere else is what happens after that i mean they don't actually stop there so what they usually do is they they take that dry sieved resin and they will make it into a ball. I mean, they will of course just press it into a you know ball like thing inside a pol- plastic and they would let it sit and you know cure a little bit so that uh, those lipids and you know um, uh, cannabinoids can be you know separated and it would be easy 
for it to you know process it later on. I mean, not that they're thinking in those ways, but it's usually what happens when you're curing it. Now, after a few months, if if you're doing it proper, then you would do it after a few months. If you're like um, you know a youngster from Srinagar who is just trying to you know make some hash, they usually do it the same day. So on that particular day, they did it the same way. They took the hash and you need uh, corn wraps, you know, uh, the corn husk, and they need to be dried and they need to be cleaned uh, before you're going to put resin inside them. So what they do is they take the dry seed resin and they completely, you know, just muff them, just fill them up and tie it very tightly, you know, bound it in a way, wound it with a thread. Then they would put a cloth over it, which is a little wet or rather wet, and then they would wound it again uh, with you know some kind of thread. Then they would light a fire and they are thrown into the fire, like directly into the fire. Now this fire is not being controlled. You have no idea what temperature what temperature it is on. You have no idea what temperature your hash is gonna go up and down to, and it's just all a matter of experience from that point onwards. I mean, once you throw that. Uh, you know, a little thingy into the fire, then you just have to know when to take it out and just beat it into a snake-like shape, which they do later on. And if you're late, then it'll be all burnt. And if you do it early, then it's just going to be a really messed up thing, which is not, uh, you know, properly homogenized. But if you do it just right and you let everything just go to a li- uh, to a liquefied form, but at the same time you bring it out and not let those... Uh, cannabinoids and terpenes degrade to a level that it won't even make you high well then you can do a perfect job because once it cools down it comes out of the fire it is perfectly homogenized because you break it open and you look at the layers i mean that tells the story i mean pretty much that how well it's done so it's a very unique process but what i really felt uh, i mean because somebody asked me a question that why would they do it what would make them uh, do such a thing why could they just not cure it like they would do in Pakistan or Afghanistan where they just like you know pack it and store it and you know leave it for months on end well there is a good answer for that because you know you, you are in Kashmir I mean this is not Pakistan or Afghanistan and uh, you know things and the culture has been so much different and you know smoking hash is not seen something you know particularly good so uh, these people have a pressure to not only harvest these plants, but at the same time process them and process them fast in a way or get get it to a form where it does not smell a lot, but it still gets you high and it's ready to go from the day one you make it. And I, I think because the decarboxylation process is happening, you know, while you're heating it and you're just speeding up, you know, that curing process although it's very rough and you shouldn't be doing it. I mean, because uh, you're just going to end up, you know, burning a lot of cannabinoids and especially terpenes. But that's the only way these people know. And when they do it actually well, it it comes out beautiful. And it's like nothing else that you've ever had. And as a matter of fact, when I met Bodhi in Allahabad, uh, you know, in 2019, January, I was able to bring some of the hash from Kashmir, which was in the powder form, and some hash, which was then made into this, you know, uh, this corn husk hash, baked hash. And then I also got some, which my friend, you know, Archaic Serpent had pressed uh, in the modern ways with some heat and, you know, pressure. So, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's a good question you asked, but um, we don't really understand, I mean, what drives the whole thing why they do it this way and not any other way but there certainly seems to be a cultural pressure and the way things have been evolving in that place that they have an urgency to process everything quickly and just uh, get it to a condensed state which is easy to hide and everything yeah of course makes sense you know different historical situation they're going to do things a bit differently so kind of in that same vein of historical things i noticed in one of your posts you were talking about how sugarcane and cannabis have a very intertwined history and you go on to talk about how it was kind of transported by a lot of slaves that were a part of the european colonialist kind of settlements would you be able to just talk a little bit about that that's a really interesting point i think 
Yeah, of, of course. I mean, uh, I mean, if you look at all the varieties which are going in West Indies, I mean, when I say West Indies, so let me just make this clear. I'm speaking of Caribbean islands. So in India, we usually do not say Caribbean or Caribbean islands. We refer to them as West Indies or West Indies islands. So <clears throat> when you look at the West Indies islands and, you know, uh, and I'm just going to speak about those places. There are so many other places that could also share the same history, but we're just not sure of them. So I'm only going to speak about them. The cannabis varieties which are growing there, and I'm not aware of the many which are, uh, they seem to be, uh, you know, a product of, uh, you know, history, you know, what happened in history, because uh, when we had, uh, you know, the colonial, colonial rule from, you know, the Britishers, so of course, you know, they had just figured out that, hey, you know what, the sugar that is so expensive back in Europe, and it's almost like a luxury, like every goddamn person is eating here. I mean, the guy who doesn't have anything on him can still have some sugar. So they thought, uh, you know, what they need to do is they need to produce it a lot more so that they could make it abundantly, you know, available in their country, in their region as well. So everyone can enjoy it. And rightly so. So uh, they started, uh, I mean, of course, doing the surveys and they understood this is a crop that would grow in tropical regions or subtropical regions. And they started looking for those places. And it just so happens at the same time, they, I mean, they had colonies at the West Indian islands and they thought, wow, this is, this is a perfect place. And these are islands, you know, we could just bring slave from, you know, these places and put them here and make them grow sugar cane. And, you know, just, uh, yeah, I mean, things really went in history, you know. So, so what they did was they got some people from Africa and some people from India, which both were their con, uh, colonies at that point in time. And, you know, they put them there in West Indian uh, Island and said, hey, you know what, go ahead and just, uh, you know, do our thing here. The farms, they already had the farm set up and they started working there. But just imagine this, these people are being taken on the ship. So it was only... Uh, uh, you know, it only made sense to these people that, you know, we're not coming back. So we have to take everything with us that, you know, we like to do on a daily basis. And cannabis seems to be one of those things. And this is a fact because we know that because if you go back uh, into the, you know, the British Commission report that they did on hemp and drugs, I, I, I don't remember the name exactly, but there's a report that was published by uh, the Britishers about the India and about the use of uh, cannabis in India and the cultural effects and the uh, physical effects as well. So that tells us that, uh, you know, even before that, uh, there, there, there was a widespread use of cannabis in India. So we know that these people took these seeds along with them to the West Indian islands and they started growing it. And, uh, you know, uh, those seeds, I mean, those varieties readily acclimatized to those regions because why the, the whole reason they were brought to West Indian islands was because the temperature and the climate was pretty similar to that of uh, where they were living in South India. So most of these, uh, you know, um, slaves were taken, taken from so Southern India and uh, very rarely from Northern India. So uh, the cannabis varieties that they brought with them just readily took off. And over time, I'm sure they must have adapted in a few different ways. I've never been there, so I don't know what they look like or any idea. Anyway, so uh, that's the connection between them. And, you know, even uh, you could just see the same thing happening in the people as well, because they got people from Africa and India. So you had people in Africa, uh, you know, who were like turned into Christians, okay, earlier when they were in Africa. And then you had Indians who were just Hindus. So now you have people in uh, West Indies right now who have a lot of people, they have very weird names, which are half English and half Hindi, like Shiv Narayan Chandra Paul. They have a Paul in their name. They have Shiva, they have Chandra. And or uh, I mean, there's just so many examples, you know. So you just see the cultural amalgamation and, you know, the way history played out in, 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 in people and in their names and in their languages and, you know, uh, the plant that they grow there. So, yeah, they had the, the, the sugar can and cannabis go back a very, very long time, in fact. Wow, okay. And so, do you think that this is kind of a bit of a two-parter, but do you think that given many people consider some of these um, 
islands to have their own kind of native land race. Do you think that that's proof that it only takes, you know, a couple hundred years for a land race to readjust and become a whole new land race? Uh, yeah, because see, land race is a very uh, broad term. Again, I mean, it, it could cover it could basically cover a lot of uh, things, right? So if you go just by the word definition, it says that any uh, domestic, uh, any traditionally domesticated variety at a certain you know geographical locale, right? But at the same time, there are plants which were not domesticated, which were there even before we ha- we were there, and we know that for a fact. This, the plants have been before us, like way before us when we came here. So how do we account for those varieties? So uh, those are the primordial land races. But yes, if you if you're saying about if you're talking about the regional land race varieties, which which I think would be a more appropriate term to use here. Uh, yes, that happens in as uh, in as small of a time as 200 to 100 years, you can see these plant varieties evolve and just become completely different varieties because of the selective environmental pressure. And of course, human beings are just all around this plant all the time. So you really have to track all the activities and understand their culture for you to really uh, you know, paint a picture that what could have happened with this plant for it to become like this today. And once you understand their culture and you understand the environment and the history, I mean, you can just paint a very comprehensive picture that how things came to be, and that just might, that might just also give you a theme or an uh, insight into you know how a cannabis plant basically adapts to different terroirs. And uh, I mean, we just need a lot more data and a lot more studying from a lot more people. But I mean, uh, this is not something that you know cannot be done. Yeah, certainly. So. I mean, this is a bit of a weird idea I've had, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. But basically, I'm wondering if you've ever noticed that in areas where historically cannabis was grown with other crops, like maybe, say, maize or sugarcane, like they were kind of grown in the same general area, maybe even the same field. Have you ever noticed that maybe those plants have increased IPM? Because what I kind of wonder is like, were these two crops, be it corn, maize and cannabis, were they ever grown side by side because maybe they benefited each other in an IPM sense or have you never really seen much like that? Sorry. Mm. Um, as far as the IPM is concerned, I think uh, it's it, it, it might be the other way around because uh, even if you look at the plants which are of the same family, like uh, the cannabis family, uh, you look at stinging nettle. I mean, nettles are of the same family as cannabis. So you, you you do see that those both of those plants are you know uh, getting affected by a similar pest, and uh, but but that really uh, I mean but that's not a thing like because cannabis plant was there that's why the pest must have gotten on to the nettle plant or because the nettle plant was there they made it the vector to ultimately reach you know the cannabis plant. But I, I think the way it really works uh, for a lot of other crops that grows along with it, like maize and, you know, you could say wheat or even potatoes, that they may have certain benefit in terms of like, you know, fixing nitrogen or something of that sort. Uh, but as far as IPM is concerned, they, they do not because, uh, you know, cannabis, as we know, is one of the plants that produces aromatic compounds. And some of the plants that we're talking about are like potato, maize and all that. They, they just do not produce aromatic compounds like cannabis. So they they just do not have the kind of, uh, you know, protection against the pests and, uh, you know, other uh, insects as cannabis as a plant has. So maybe cannabis provides them security from the pest. But again, I don't know. I've never looked into that, never thought of it, but definitely a great thought. I'm going to make a note of it right now. And, you know, next this year when I go out, I will try to look for that. I will try to look for some uh, some conclusive data that could, uh, you know, show clearly what what's happening, uh, whether, you know, cannabis is helping the other plants, you know, uh, not get a lot of pest or actually they're using it as a vector to get on to the other plant. So I'll try to collect data and definitely get back to you this year. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. So thanks so much for that. Um, now let's move on to some viewers from our questions that we had submitted just a couple of hours ago and we got some good ones. 
And so the first one, I think it's going to be a little hard, but um, first question is, do you think there'll be a time in the near future where Americans will be able to travel through the farms of Pakistan and Afghanistan? I mean, they're doing right now. So, <clears throat> I mean, I, I don't really understand that question, uh, basically, because people are doing right now. It's only a matter of finances and it's only a matter of courage because, see, nobody's going to stop an American from getting a visa for Pakistan or Afghanistan. I mean, if anything, it's the other way around. It's hard to get a get an American or a European or Australian visa for people who are in Asian countries, especially India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, right? So I think it's only a matter of... Uh, courage and resources, I guess. You, you can go there and you can roam around. I mean, I've certainly seen a couple of French guys, you know, who were there. They took some pictures, got some seed for some of the European seed banks recently. So, but if you're maybe referring to it in a way that when things would legalize, then I'm not sure if things are going to legalize very, very soon, but we don't know what's going to happen in future. And all we can do is just stay hopeful that it does happen and, you know, everybody could be out in the open and, you know, flaunt their weed on the Instagram without having to fear about, you know, getting abjected or, you know, taken into custody. Yeah, of course. Uh, so the next question is, have you ever found any land races that kind of have a strawberry smell to them and specifically any Pakistanis with the strawberry smell? Um, I have smelt a few plants in highland regions, which is around Uttarakhand and Himachal Pradesh. They had a distinct smell of strawberry, but they were just one odd plant, which were growing in a very variable uh, population. So I didn't really think of, you know, getting those seeds and didn't really think that it's going to help me, you know, get to that terpene profile. Uh, but if you talk about Pakistani, I'm going to say no, because most of that stuff is like really uh, acrid and, you know, um, spicy and like toluene like smell, like phenol like smell. Do you, you guys use do you guys use like a disinfectant? It's called Dettol. And it has that yep. phen phenol. Yeah, it has yeah. that phenol, phenol smell in it. And you, you get that a lot. And, and toluene smell that comes from the whitener, you know, the correction whitener. People even you know use it to get high sometimes, and so those uh, <laughs> those uh, smells can, uh, are pretty uh, you know pretty often found in Pakistani varieties. But I think there was one Balochistani variety which came from our Balochistani friend that he claims has apples and strawberry like smell. Now I haven't started growing them yet, so I'm not going to go ahead and say if yes or no, but we'll see. But I have complete faith because uh, we're not talking about a cross-pollinated uh, you know, uh, uh, population here. These are the plants which have been, you know, selectively inbred by, 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 the fam by the family itself and they keep it within the family. So, I mean, if he's specifically pointing towards, you know, strawberry and uh, apple, and they seem to have a very good understanding towards the flavors because they're eating so many different fruits over there. So I think I'll trust him and we'll see if, uh, you know, it does come out exactly like strawberry. I mean, that would be amazing because I've never had anything uh, that is like even close to the strawberry. And, and, and that's kind of, like I wanted to ask, in, in fact, I wanted to ask you a question and I asked that question to everyone that I speak of from, you know, from the Western society that it's, it's the smells that people talk about. I mean, often people talking about like smells like banana and people are talking about smell like rubber. And I've never smelled those uh, things on plants. I've mean, never smelled a plant that was exactly like a banana or like exactly like rubber. So. Could you maybe tell me, I'm sorry, I'm, but I'm just curious, I want to know, I mean, are there plants that really actually smell straight up like that? Yeah, that's a really good question. So in terms of the banana one, I've smelled the popular clone only banana OG and stuff like that in the States. It smells like a candy banana, not like a real banana. So I can understand why you would say I've never smelled anything like banana because I think the reality is no one's really smelled anything that smells like an actual banana, but people have smelled things that smells like a candy banana, which is just probably like two or three of the main terpenes that come out of a banana, but obviously not a full spectrum picture of what it actually is. And then in terms of the rubber one, 
I hear people say that all the time, but I myself have never smelt anything that smells like rubber. I think maybe it's just a general term people use to describe a more acrid, maybe kind of, um, yeah, like offensive smell. But yeah, I would agree with you. If we're going to be very strict about it, I've never smelt anything that smells like a real banana or like real burnt rubber. Okay, because I was really curious about that. I had a word with... Um, again, I don't know his name, and I'm really bad with this. I don't ask people's name. Um, Pipsweet, you must know him. He must be your friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I like Pipsweet. Pip <laughs> He's an amazing guy. I mean, I've been speaking to him for uh, you know some time now, and you know, he, I, I was really interested because he had this uh, variety that's called Rubber City, and I just you know asked him, does that really actually smells like rubber? And I, I think w what he said was really interesting because I think he said uh, pretty much similar to what you said that, well, it's not exactly, you know, closing your eyes and, you know, that you would be able to imagine rubber like smell, but it's more like an oniony offensive smell that could, you know, at times be, uh, you know, felt like it is coming off as a bunt rubber. So, you know, I had to get a pack from him and, you know, I'm just going to grow and see. Uh, you know what exactly it's like i'm really curious so i really want to see yeah yeah no that's that's an interesting one i mean i got a little follow-up question for that do you have any issues getting seeds in from like america or the eu uh seeds uh i mean like getting seeds from america to india or to yeah yeah, india yeah like if people send you stuff do you ever really have any issues with it or it usually always makes it no, no issues at all. I mean, India is very, very cool. I mean, especially if it's coming from America or Europe, Australia, New Zealand, uh, I mean, these great countries. I mean, we just don't really bother about that. Yeah, if I'm getting seeds from Pakistan, Afghanistan, you know, that's when we really tend to have issues. Yeah. yeah understandable okay well uh the next question i think is a really good one and the person says what is one of the land races that you uh, that you've experienced i guess we should say regional cultivars if we're going to be correct um that you've found that you would recommend for like kind of a home grower who's just looking to start out with a land race they don't want anything that's going to get too unruly or really out of control like just to help them get their feet wet what would you recommend that, uh, that's an amazing question, I mean, because we I think about it all the time because, I mean, as much as I want to, you know, motivate other people and talk about preservation, the ground reality is, is that people have responsibilities and people have to feed their families and they have to, you know, manage their space and do other work as well, right? And that's what life is all about. So in order to strike balance, uh, there has to be some varieties, you know, who would let you preserve a land race variety or an heirloom variety or like a regional variety. But at the same time, it will not bother you a lot that it would interfere with, you know, your work. Let's just, for an example, let's say you you only have one tent, which is four by four, and you're going some OG cushion there and you have uh, Kerala gold. It's, it's going to grow really wide and tall and eventually you would be forced to lift your lights up. But your OG Kush may not grow that tall and then it would have to be, you know, lifted up or you would have to do some kind of makeshift arrangement. So it will be a constant improvising, you know, which is not really a, a big problem, though. But everybody's not does not have the kind of schedule to uh, be in their, uh, uh, you know, grow room all the time and do these adjustments. So I think... Uh, as we discussed earlier, the Pakistani varieties are perfect. I mean, they bring, you know, both uh, the best of the both were, you know, the uh, narrow slim leaf and, you know, the broad leaf varieties in a way that is just unparalleled. And again, they, they the, uh, the variety and the variation is still there. Nobody has selected it for anything specifically. So you can pretty much, you know, uh, turn your magic on them. So Swabi would be one of those things, uh, one of those varieties. I mean, it has an amazing high, amazing high for a variety, you know, that uh, uh, that people have not heard of so much. And it's very easy to grow, I'm going to say that. And, you know, it's not going to get, uh, you know, all unruly and it's not going to become like a swamp monster inside your tent. You'll be able to control it. Uh, so I think uh, just, you know, keep an eye out for that Swabi lines that's going to come out. He's going to, Mass Medical is going to, you know, uh, release them pure in the long flowering and the short flowering version. And I'm sure he'll be working on some hybrids. That's like his thing. But yeah, those would be really good options to pounce on to if people just want to get into and not really get into very deep waters straight away 
this is this is a great way to get a taste of it and not get into trouble. Yeah, what a great answer. So the next question we have from our viewer is, how do you know Baba Ko? Okay, that, uh, that's a very interesting story because uh, initially I, I met him over the Instagram. I, I came across uh, his account, and, but I never really did send him any message because uh, that's usually how we were not working. I mean, we, were, we had like stop sending messages to random people and, you know, getting random seats from them. So we were kind of like traveling out to places more, working more like that. So um, at, the, at the same time, uh, I had a uh, you know I had a friend in Delhi, uh, you know who's basically a South Indian, uh, but he was in Delhi at that point in time, and he was also f- following him uh, somehow. I, I don't know what the connection was basically, but uh, Baba he he came to India because uh, you know do, do, I'm not going to go into the details of his affair because he was there for some kind of hospital related thing. Uh, you know, that they have to come because they don't have that kind of services in Afghanistan and, you know, India just seem to have uh, a little better when it comes to, you know, medical services, doctors and all. So he was here for that and, you know, he wanted to smoke. So uh, he basically called, uh, you know, the guys, uh, you know, who live in Delhi, guys who are usually doing the balana stuff and, you know, they offered to give him some hash. But I think because it was very costly, so, you know, he was not sure whether or not he going to get it. So then... Uh, Subsequently, he contacted me and he told me, you know, hey, you know what, this guy is from Afghanistan and he's in Delhi. I mean, you know, this would be a great opportunity. You guys can connect and see, you know, if you, know, you can, guys can get some kind of trade going for seats. And I was like, sure, sure, give me the phone number. And he gave me the phone, num- phone number. I sent him a WhatsApp message and I was like, hey, how are you doing? I follow you and I've seen some pictures, you know, cannabis, you're from Afghanistan and whatnot. And I told him, hey, you know what, like, you're welcome to India and I would like to make sure you're taken care of. Just call my friends in Delhi and, you know, told them to get some hash to him ASAP, free of cost, of course, and make sure he's taken care of. So that happened. And, you know, he said, I'm going to remember that. He, he went back and he did. And, you know, he said, OK, um, you know, if you want seed, I could send you seeds. And I told him that, you know, this is what we do. We actually take seeds from indigenous communities or farmers directly. You know, we, uh, you know, give them out to other people who need it in the West. And, you know, they kind of pay for it. And, you know, that uh, money could be distributed amongst, you know, people who are collecting it and people, you know, who are connected to the operation in many different ways as they deserve. Now, he was he was really game for that because, you know, of course, everybody needs some financial help at the end of the day. And, you know, I, I set up, uh, uh, you know, I, I spoke to these people at Full Power Selection and told them basically, you know, we're going to do this and we're going to do a pre-order and seeds were on its way. And next thing you know, the seeds get busted. So seeds didn't make it to India. And, and this is around, this is happening like a beginning of April 2018. Okay. And I got really nervous. I was like, I have to get these seeds. And again, you know, Baba told me that, hey, man, I'm game for this. I mean, I will do anything. You just tell me what I have to do and I will get this thing to you. I mean, uh, I absolutely have no problem. It's just the way government, you know, works. And what we, uh, you know, realized at that point in time, the only way around it was to actually get the guy, you know, uh, actually fly the guy over to India and, you know, ask him to simply just get the seeds because they're not going to, you know, take it out on the airport because basically to possess seeds is legal in India because of the, you know, religious, uh, you know, things attached to it. So that's exactly what he did. He flew uh, along with so many different varieties and, you know, we picked him, <clears throat> we picked him up and came to Delhi and from Delhi, we got him to, you know, our headquarters, just somewhere near, you know, Punjab Shivalik. And, you know, we sat, we spoke, I tried to understand the culture as much as I could because, uh, you know, uh, language is a little bit of problem, not much of a problem because he does understand Hindi, you know, which is our language. Uh, and but I don't seem to really understand, you know, the Arabic language or the Farsi language that much. Uh, So he speaks English, uh, you know, as well, not as much, but, you know, as much as you could, he could make you understand what he's trying to say. So that was great. We we sat there for about a week and, you know, we went out to a few places, you know, roamed around Punjab, had a good time. He gave me the seeds and then, you know, we, we, we sent him back with all due respect. And, you know, that's where we really started to work with those seeds. And I think I, I, I did get to, you know, send him like a couple more times. There were a few different varieties. I went ahead and documented those varieties for him, you know. 
so that you know that inf- uh, so not just seeds but information could also become you know available to people so that when they're growing it and if they see something peculiar they can fall back to that cultural historical geographical data and see if that has any relevance to it i mean that's basically how the findings are made and uh yeah, that went on for about a year. But uh, then, you know, of course, we are a small collective and uh, you got to understand, I mean, you know, full power selection, even they're just like a couple of my friends. So we can send out like a lot of orders. So we, we have to, we can only do a limited amount of work. But, you know, uh, you know, he had a, a massive amount of seeds and, you know, he had so much more coming in. So, you know, it was only the best that, you know, he... <clears throat> got in contact with you know bigger seed banks who have the ability to take more orders and the ability to you know uh, send out more orders readily and you know that's exactly what he's doing which is fabulous and i'm really happy you know that he's been able to do so much for himself and you know all the credit is to him i mean like you know it's it, it's all been him he collected those varieties he understood they need to be preserved he took immense amount of risk getting those varieties out to these different places so you know i i have a great amount of respect for for him and you know he has uh, really been a central figure in this whole movement and i think i'm i was pretty lucky to have met him at a certain point in my life yeah awesome what a great little recount on that introduction so the next question we had was what's the single most surprising smell you've come across from a regional cultivar yeah, the single most uh you know weird or I would say weird smell was there was this one plant that was growing in Bailing Valley and it has a smell which is straight like ammonia like hi- like hydrogen you know uh, should I say uh, I, I mean uh, you in India they use a cheap uh, you know derivative that is uh, you know used to color the hair you know to bleach your hair as basically uh, hydrogen I think if I'm not wrong and it it has that stringent ammonia like smell to it uh, right and you know the same smell that comes from urine as well because there's ammonia in it so i i could smell exactly the straight ammonia smell from a plant it was a really ugly plant i have i i took a picture of that and i made a post about that and back in 2017 if you go down my uh, you know feed you can actually find that post from 2017 and you can also look at the plant it looks weird. It does not look at all like any of the plants which were growing there. And, you know, the smell was something, I mean, it was just awful. I mean, <laughs> awful in a very good way. It was straight ammonia. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like you found like the uh, the regional cultivar equivalent of the roadkill skunk. But there you go. We'll have to look more for it. So the next question we had was, do you have any tips or tricks for people who are trying to grow high altitude cultivars at sea level? Uh, <clears throat> I, I, I don't really think, I mean, uh, I mean given that, you know, uh, cannabis as adaptive as adaptive as a plant that it is and rightly so it's called the weed you know for that reason um you you never what i've experienced from my growing and i don't have a lot of experience but this is what i'm going to tell you from my experience whatever i have that cannabis does not require like very special things you don't have to make it so hard on you and you know you grow and if you keep it simple, I, I pretty much believe every plant uh, does pretty much good as long as you're growing it in, in a 22 degrees to a 26, 27 degrees Celsius range, temperature range and you know, hum- relative humidity is somewhere around like 50, 55, 60 and you, know, you're, you have a decent soil medium. You don't really have to uh, you know, worry about uh, things at all. But on the other hand, if you are growing an equatorial variety and you happen to be living in a place uh, which happens to be higher up in the latitude, that means you can have a shorter season uh, for flowering. So then you have to, uh, you know, then you have to ensure that, uh, you know, either you're working with a variety that's not going to flower, you know, past November or you just have to grow it indoors and you know put it into flowering straight away instead of giving it veg time because even if you grow those equatorials or highland narrow leaf varieties you know straight away under 12 to 12 which is basically what induces the flowering in them they still have go on to grow pretty much like four or five six feet and if you wedge them then i mean it's really going to be a problem if you're not expecting yeah right <laughs> they just get out of hand all of a sudden um 
Cool. Okay. So the final question from our viewers that they've submitted is, have you ever made your way over towards kind of Thailand and down that way? Um, I have been to Burma. I mean, I have to, uh, you know, you can actually go to Burma, you know, without a visa and without a passport. So I've been to Burma, but I'm planning to go down Thailand this year. And, you know, I have a great friend there. Uh, they have a beautiful collective, you know, they're preserving Thai and, you know, other land races from, you know, different regions. So I really want to go there and meet them. I do have friends in Laos as well. I have friends in Cambodia as well. And, you know, I, I'm really meaning to meet them because I did get seeds from them last year and I was able to help them. I was able to, you know, give back to them. And they were really happy, you know, that I told them something and I came through and, you know, they kind of trust me with it. So I'm just going to go and meet them in person and, you know, establish a deeper relationship and try to collect some data as well firsthand. Wow, that sounds really cool. So now on to our last little quick fire questions before we wrap things up. So the first one I had for you was, in your opinion, what kind of little pocket or region of the world has really fantastic cannabis but just doesn't often get recognized for it? Uh, cold desert regions, which are basically in the Trans Himalayan ranges, I don't think I, I think they're completely unheard of. Nobody talks about them. Yet they seem to have plants, you know, which would uh, rival most of the you know modern varieties only in terms of you know resin production, not in terms of high or the structure, but in terms of the amount of resin that they can produce. They can pretty much be at par with some of the you know, modern varieties. Wow, yeah, you, you bang on right. I hadn't heard of those at all, really. So the next question is, what's what's the one type of cannabis that you've always been looking for but you've never really found, you know? Is it like a certain smell or a certain look? Like, what are you still chasing? Uh, I mean, I'm pretty much not... Uh I mean, I'm not trying to chase like a specific flavor or a specific kind of plant or what I'm rather trying to chase is uh, as many places as I can, you know, so that I have a rather complete picture of the evolution of this plant, or at least I can, you know, forward this data to people who are competent enough or have the scientific abilities to put a bigger picture together of, you know, how this plant evolved into these different types. Because although we can, you know, classify them and we can do all the labeling we want, but that doesn't really tell us, you know, what actually happened, how they evolved into these different and branched off into these different plants. So what I'm really after is, you know, uh, if I can just somehow get, get to all of these places physically, within this lifetime and then, you know, concise that data in one, like a book kind of thing, or I mean, not necessarily, but in one place. And then, you know, other people can take that data and then they can, you know, develop it further as we advance. And, you know, as more scientific people will be, you know, coming into the industry because it's no longer a stigmatized industry. So what we're seeing, if you're seeing a surge of, you know, scientists and, you know, engineers and even, you know, one of my friends is a software engineer. So they want to do it. They don't feel like it's wrong anymore. So this is the time when we are going to really see a very steep curve of, you know, the advancement in the understanding of cannabis all across the world. Uh, but, you know, what is really going to be uh, of the prime importance here is going to be that data. And I mean, if you don't have that, if you don't really have the data and those things are gone, and it's going to be really, really hard to really reconcile the complete picture. Yeah, very valid answer right there. So, what is your favorite cannabis that you've ever had, be it flower, hash? What's the single one that stands out the most in your memory as the best ever? best ever the best ever for me would have to be Lolab Valley I mean, I mean and the Lolab Valley is it, it, I mean I don't have words and I'm not even going to attempt to explain it in words I mean, I'm just going to say this is the best kind of effects if and I'm only speaking in terms of effects and nothing else the way it makes you feel the, uh, the place it takes you as a person when you get high on this so I like that place a lot. And, you know, other cannabis also takes me to these different places and I like them. 
but you know lolab valley northern kashmiri varieties take me to a place that is just unparalleled and you know i i just love it i mean you you just get some some seeds from me if you want and grow them and smoke them and you'll you'll know what i'm talking about uh music to my ears my friend i'll have to take you up on that but I want to give you a good little remix question. So often we hear people talk about, oh, you know, I got to try this Landry strain and it wasn't really that good or something to that effect, you know, like standard Western person. So here's the remix for you. Have you ever tried a more modern strain, maybe like a Cali import or something, and you were like a bit disappointed? Um, I I was, but I think uh, that was primarily because... Uh, it was not grown by me, it was grown by someone else. And I felt that, you know, uh, had it been grown properly, I mean, it, it, it would have certainly lived up to the expectations. Because see, like I said in the beginning, in India, I mean, hybrid uh, wheat sells for any uh, anywhere between $800 to $1,500 or $1,200 at least for an ounce. And the biggest reason behind that is, is the poten- I'm sorry, is the potency that you cannot find in the regional varieties here. You just cannot. I mean, uh, the high is unparalleled in the uh, hybrid repertoire that you guys have over there. So uh, it's very hard to be disappointed. I mean, I mean, I, I don't really understand. I mean, um, you know, how can somebody be disappointed? But then at the same time, I can understand if all you have is all of this good weed, then you tend to have a relative scale, you know, which is mapped against some of the best varieties like Cam Dog or OG Kush. So then people tend to uh, or had been like things then people tend to like, you know, compare everything to that. And by the virtue of that comparison, you know, some of the people who are regularly you know, experiencing these things could say that, you know, that this thing is uh, not going to get you that high or it's not that enjoyable or this is crap. If somebody chooses to talk that way, then. But for us, it's really hard to say a hybrid sucks because, I mean, we're like smoking varieties mostly, you know, which are not that potent. OK, so. Uh, you know, it's hard for somebody from India to just smoke a hybrid and say that it is not good, especially if it's coming from USA, because I see a lot of good work happening in USA and there are so many people doing it. I mean, I mean, I think the plant is in very good hands in America. Yeah, hard to argue that they're not progressing things forward in a lot of ways. So, final question of the interview. This brings us to it. And this is the one I wanted to ask you the most. If you could go anywhere and select seeds from any area, any point in time in history, where would you go and what seeds would you want to get? Okay. If I could go back in history and I could like, wow, that's a good question. I, and I'm, I've, I'll have to think about it because I've never thought about it before. So, just give me a second. Take as long as you need, my friend. <laughs> okay, where would I want to go? Then that's uh, yeah. Uh, okay, I think I know. What I would like to do is uh, I, I, okay, and you could only go to one place. Yeah, just one place. Oh man, that's hard. Okay, then I would like to go to that uh, you know near that cave at exactly the same point in time you know in Tibet where they just found this evidence for, you know, uh, some cannabis, which was used by, you know, some people some hundred thousand years ago. So I would want to be at that point in time and get some of those, grab some of those seeds while those primitive gentlemen are, you know, smoking on their cannabis and just take my time machine and come back. Hell yeah, just get that primordial stuff. (laughs) Yeah, I'm all for that. (laughs) What a brilliant answer. Well... That just about brings us to the end of it. Did you have any comments or shout outs you wanted to make? Oh, no, not, not really. Uh, I think uh, I think you were really able to, I mean, just walk over I mean, all these things and then you asked some things which I hadn't even thought about. So really, um, I'm just all empty here, man, like unless you have a question. No, no, no. That's awesome, my friend. Well, I mean, thank you so much for joining us on the show, Irizing, and you know, dropping all the knowledge about the land races and the local cultivation. I think people are going to really love this one. Thank you so much. I really want to appreciate you from the bottom of my heart because, you know, I'm a big fan. And uh, let me tell you before we go, I mean, 2017, I think, was the year that 
I heard your podcast for the first time, man, you know, so I've known about this thing for such a long time. And, you know, it is an absolute privilege to be here today and be able to speak to you and share my thoughts through your reputed platform. Thank you so much. Oh, man, the pleasure is all mine. And there we have it, guys, a four-hour block of pure information download straight to your brain from your boy Irizin. I'm so appreciative. So much I didn't know about Indian stuff. I hope you guys have learned a lot. And like me, I hope you're excited to go to India and do your own land race hunt now. As always, huge shout out to Coppet Biological Systems, best predator mites, microbial products, and artificial feeds in the game. Huge shout out to CT now, guarantee on satisfaction, not just germination. And as always, big love to the Patreon gang. You guys are the best. Dragonfly Earth Medicine, we love you guys. Long time. I'll see you for the next one, guys. Let's see.